Hey, everybody, this is Perch. I'm here with Joe Corral again, and uh, we're talking to the great Jim Salakrab. How, how are you today? I'm Smurftastic. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> you, we should explain. Uh, you, you, you're, you've got a Smurf product you're working on, or you've, you've worked on, rather, I should say. Oh, we're the uh, North American uh, publishers of the, of the Smurfs, and uh, we, uh, you know, I think have an exclusive license on the uh, American English language. So, so <laughs> some of our books wind up uh, in Malaysia, all, all around the world, and, and wherever people you know can speak uh, English, uh, except for England. You know, I think there's an English <laughs> publisher. Well, who, uh, yeah, publishes yeah. the Smurfs there. It's uh, well, Smurftastic time to have you here. Um, yeah, it's uh, you've uh, you've worked. I mean, so I think everybody knows your name, but you've you've worked <laughs> for. Uh, a, I mean, some major companies, major people. We're going to get into all that, uh, but um, I wanted to just ask. You started when you were fifteen in this business. Is that right? Well, uh, yes. Uh, what sort of inspired it in a way? I always. Uh, wanted to work in comics as soon as I stumbled upon comics. And actually, when I was 14, I wound up working uh, with Jeanette Kahn. I oh. had, uh, she was uh, you know, involved with a magazine called Kids, uh, Kids Magazine. And it was, uh, the premise was it was by kids for kids. And uh, uh, when I was... Uh, around 14, 13, 12, you know, I was uh, doing lots of cartoons and trying to get published and uh, sending letters to the comic books, anything to, you know, such a thrill to see your name in print. It, it still is. And uh, yeah. so when I saw this magazine, you know, uh, yeah, I figured what the heck, you know, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll send in my stuff and, uh, uh, and they originally were, I think, in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they moved to New York City. And uh, I think due to the, uh, you know, the move, and they had to get an issue out, they sort of went through all their submissions and uh, you know, plucked out the ones that were in New York. And uh, <laughs> I got a call and, you know, I got to do all sorts of fun assignments and meet Jeanette Kahn, who went on to become the president of, of uh, DC Comics. Mm -hmm. uh, there was another kid there at the time. Uh, and I was a little jealous that we were same age. And I think he drew a little better than me and he wrote a little better than me. But I get to lord it over him whenever we meet uh, that uh, I'm the one who wound up with a career in comics. And he, Tom Gamel, had to settle for just being a producer on Seinfeld and The Simpsons. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he wishes okay. he was in comics. <laughs> Absolutely. You got, Absolutely. The better, you got the better gig, for sure. But right. as a result of, like, simply sending in submissions, you know, to fanzines and all sorts of, you know, kids magazine and getting published, I thought, well, you know, I mean, through the fanzines, I, I read so many interviews with uh, artists that said, you know, which schools they went to. So I was planning and uh, to go to the high school of uh, art and design in uh, Manhattan. I grew up in the Bronx and, you know, but I figured what the heck. I remember towards the end of <laughs> when I was in junior high school, I was, you know, like uh, we were all going to graduate soon. So that we weren't even teaching us much anymore. You know, so, so the classes were pretty relaxed. And one of the other kids had a copy of uh, Daredevil number 77. And he, he looks at me and goes, are you J.A. Salakrup? You know, that's how, for some reason, I was signing my, my stuff back then. My full name is James Alexander Salakrup. I'm very, <laughs> very serious back then. But uh, when I came to Marvel, it was John Romita who started calling me Jim. And I've been Jim Salakrup ever since. But back then, and, and I said, yeah, that's, that's me. And, had, and, and I had a letter published in a, a Daredevil comic. Awesome. And... Uh, I was thinking, well, this this is this is great. You just 
just contact these people and your work is in print. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, uh, you know, what the heck, what do I got to lose? I did a little postcard. I drew like my, you know, lousy version of a Herb Trimpey, Incredible Hulk, and, you know, using markers and everything. And, uh, but yeah, basically I, I wanted to get their attention. So, you know, but it was also heartfelt in that I said, I'll be your slave. I'll do anything. Cause I'd read so many interviews where yeah. cartoonists, when they were first starting out, uh, would be assistants and they'd, they'd clean the, uh, ink points and the race pages and yeah do what was ever needed go out yeah. get coffee uh, and uh, little did i know <laughs> <laughs> this was back in the, the summer of 1972 that marvel had recently been uh, purchased by cadence and it was expanding rapidly you know from throughout the 60s there was just about a dozen titles but once the 70s hit you know they were just cranking out more and more titles and uh, they were desperate they were understaffed and uh, one of the things that was happening back in the days when there was still a comics code authority is that in order to save time because they were running behind on schedules and so they would, they would, during the 60s, they probably would have just mailed. They were probably so far ahead. The uh, original artwork to the Comics Code Authority's offices, mm -hmm. and they would usually probably approve everything. And then they would then mail it on to the, the printer in um, Sparta, Illinois. Uh, but as they began to have all sorts of production delays, they were spending a lot of money on uh, on messengers in those pre FedEx uh, internet yep. times. So Roy Thomas, who was then the editor in chief in seventy two, he had a, a rather enlightened policy, which I was uh, <laughs> benefited from directly. He felt no matter what position in the office that they they would hire someone. If they could get someone who knew anything about comics, that would help. They could get that person to lend a hand. They needed help. They needed more hands. Yep. And so, I mean, the stereotype of a messenger back then would have been so in my age now who would be smoking a cigar and sitting in the reception area waiting for the next package to deliver. But with, with me, it was, oh, here's someone who... Look, he drew a picture of the Hulk. He, you know, he, he wrote yep. a clever little thing. You know, we, we could probably use this kid. And uh, so they had me come in. Uh, John Romita Sr. gave me a, a tour of the bullpen, uh, which included, like, John, uh -huh. uh, yeah, well, him, John Romita Sr., yeah. <laughs> Herb Trimpey, uh, Maurice Severin, Stan Lee, Roy Thomas, Steve Gerber, George Rousseau's, you know, on and on. I felt coming from the Bronx, like uh, I was just this mere mortal who had somehow ascended to Asgard and was seeing yeah. all my comic book gods. I was like struck dumb. I was like, <laughs> you know, I can't yeah. believe I'm actually here. I thought I had to go through this whole process of, you know, graduating high school, maybe college and putting a portfolio. And then maybe if I was lucky someday, you know, I might, you know, be able to get some work but no i sent a postcard in <laughs> <laughs> at 15 and i think what happened is uh saul brodsky who was the you know had returned to marvel after uh, attempting to have his own company with skywall mm -hmm. you know was was sort of um you know like uh, he originally at that point they had replaced him when he left with john report who was the production manager but because yeah. they were expanding so much you know, Stan was more than happy to, you know, bring Saul back. And they were letting John just handle <laughs> the incredible amount of um, comics they were producing. But Stan at that point also was planning all sorts of new things. And that's where Saul came in, where he was sort of the production manager involved with uh, helping, you know, like when Marvel took over doing the, the British comics themselves and black and white magazines, anything that wasn't a standard you know, Marvel color comic book. So, uh, so when Saul probably saw my uh, uh, postcard, 
and knowing what Marvel's budgets <laughs> have traditionally <laughs> been, oh, here's someone who works for free. But, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Roy I, I, insisted, no, no, pay the kid. And, uh, you know, we, I got minimum wage or something. And one of the odd things, you know, being a kid from the Bronx again, uh, that summer, you know, collecting a uh, – a uh, salary. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was like unthinkable. I mean, I, I, I really would have been happy, you know, just <laughs> working there for free, but no, I was getting all this money. And for the only one time in my life, I actually reached a point. I remember it clearly where I thought, gee, there's nothing else I want to buy. I, <laughs> I got everything <laughs> I wanted. And uh, that's never happened again since. Once I moved out when I was 18, you know, the shock of, yeah, it was the complete opposite. Oh, you yeah. have to pay yeah. for everything. <laughs> <laughs> I love this is no fun at all. Yeah. I love that. It's so at 15. You have this dream to be in the industry and you find yourself uh, paid by Marvel, getting a tour of their office by John Romita being right in the middle of all that. But that just had to have been incredible. Just that moment. It just was uh, it literally was a dream come true. And, uh, and I, I savored and loved every, every second of it. It was a, uh, a great environment, uh, uh, seeing all these people moving around, and 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 Stan himself couldn't have been nicer. He was, uh, you know, welcomed me, and uh, one of the uh, <laughs> the uh, odd assignments I had at one point, uh, there was this woman who was his um, then secretary at the moment, uh, who later went on to. Uh, you know, marry Jerry Conway. Uh, her name was Carla Josephs back then. And uh, it was like a lot of times I would take on different things to work on and I'd be working late in the office. And there was one night I remember she, she sort of grabbed me by the arm and like, you know, pulled me into, you know, Stan's office, you know, like, Oh, what's going on here? And uh, she said, promise not to laugh. Okay. And uh, <laughs> you wouldn't have done well, Joe. <laughs> but uh, I said, okay, uh, whatever. And uh, when I had it, my assignment was uh, she gave me an address. I had to go pick up Stanley's toupee. And uh, I went to this, uh, I think it was on the east side, a little brownstone building. And I'd only seen places like this in movies where they have uh, – what do they call them? During Prohibition, they had those clubs. Yeah, speakeasy. Speak yeah, speak it looked like it was like it had one of those doors with a little window in the door, and you knock on the door. And they go, Who is it? Yeah, I'm, like, I'm here to package for Mister Lee. And the guy opens the window and you go, "You don't look Chinese." And it's like, "Oh, geez, please!" And oh, no. uh, they gave me this package. You know, brown paper tied with string. And here you go, kid. And uh, you know that night when Stan was leaving, he was like, "Thanks a lot, Jim." You know, <laughs> <So> <laughs> thank you, Stan. So uh, it, oh, it was just absolutely wonderful. You know, to see all the comics that they were you know producing back then, and you know, so many uh, legends would come into the office. You know, like. Uh, uh, Bill Everett, who uh, had a, a, a cranky sense of humor, which I got a kick out of. He said, I'm here to work on the submariner. You know, <laughs> <laughs> God, you know so it great. was just uh, everyone was there. You know, like Starenko was uh, uh, having a meeting one night with um, Stan and they were rehashing things and, you know, getting, you know, Stan was getting Jim to return to Marvel. And one of the things he was going to do was, uh, you know, head up the Foom <laughs> Marvel mm -hmm. fan club. And, and, uh, as they were leaving, you know, uh, it was the same thing with Roy again, like a uh, Stan says, Hey, you're, you're doing great, Jim. You know, and, uh, you know, <laughs> thank me for working so hard. And, you know, Starenko of course just says, pay the kid more money. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But it was every, I mean, I, I you know, like uh, we were in an office that was never listed 
in the comics. I, I think the comics would always list Marvel's address as 625 Madison Avenue back yeah. then. And that Marvel probably was there years before, but as they got a little bigger, needed more room, they had rented out space in the, the Vision building at 635 mm -hmm. Madison. We were upstairs from the National Lampoon, Ooh, which yeah. was the you know right downstairs room. And so you saw a lot of mixing with uh, uh, artists and writers suddenly popping up in the National Lampoon magazine. Uh, one of the weirdest things was, uh, I, I, I hope I don't mangle his name too much. I remember clearly there was this guy, uh, Michelle Choquette, was coming up and getting work from various people and for some strange project. And I, you know, for many years, uh, nothing ever really materialized. And I wondered what the heck was that? And it was like uh, recently, a few years ago, something like over 40, almost 50 years later, it was published as the Someday Funnies, you know, material that was done way back in the 70s where they were, they contacted some of the greatest artists in the world, uh, including the, the, a bunch of Marvel guys, uh, to do these one page sort of like Sunday comics commenting on, you know, satirically or ever, however they wish to do it on the sixties. So it's one of those many projects that I thought I'd never live long enough <laughs> or that it would never ever come out. And so I was really thankful for Abrams uh, to publish that thing. It was, uh, Oh yeah. Uh, worth the wait as far as I'm concerned. It even had a page in it by, uh, uh, of Asterix that the only nice. place that by the original creators, Gossini and Uderzo. And now I'm here at Paper Cuts and we're publishing Asterix. So it almost <laughs> feels like full circle somehow. Oh, wow. well, that has a way of coming back around eventually. Right. Um, you, you were at Marvel for, for a, a long time. Um, 20 years. Yeah. 72 to 92. And yeah. you saw you a lot up, of people come and go. <laughs> yeah, and you wound up being there for a pretty interesting part of their history. I mean, you, you, you have your name on, I think probably what a lot of people believe are kind of the biggest books that were ever done. I mean, <laughs> Jim Shooter once was teasing me like, you know, uh, cause he was, you know, it, it was automatic that his name was, he was the editor in chief of uh, his imperial sure. and everything. Yep. But he saw that I was like always trying to get my name on whatever I worked on. And uh, he might have said something like, why, you just want your name plastered all over the place. And uh, and I said, no, just on, <laughs> just on uh, what I actually worked on. But one of the things he, he Go figure, technically yeah. was right is there, there was a long period of time where uh, assistant editors weren't getting any credit. And sneaky me, I uh, two things I did in that regard. One was uh, first on the letter columns, because a lot of times the, the assistant editors wrote the letter columns, you know, so I, I just, why don't we have a little tiny box <laughs> that mm -hmm. says, you know, gives the editor credit and assistant editor credit. This was obviously right. was an assistant editor when I suggested that. And mm -hmm. then later I even suggested like on the bullpen bulletins page, well, yeah, there, there's room at the top there. I could say, <laughs> <laughs> who the editorial staff is, you know, lots of magazines in the world include, you know, their editorial staff. And yeah, so yeah. I, I did figure out a way to get my name in all the Marvel books. <laughs> That's nice. awesome. I'm glad you did. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you wind up, uh, so, you know, you, you're, you get to be part of the, um, be a part of the kind of a pretty legendary uncanny x-men run um, i i fell into that i was originally uh it, it's it's funny i mean i sort of was like the zealot of marvel in a way and that you know i i sort of saw how chris first really got involved with the uh, x-men and it was just he was just someone who really, really, really wanted to break into Marvel and do stuff. And uh, 
and sometimes it, it really is a matter of uh, you know being the squeaky wheel and and I think what they thought was uh, well X Men mm -hmm. yeah. always a perennial uh, loser as far as uh, sales go so yeah. uh, they brought it back and the people who were working on it were busy with what they perceived to be more successful properties that they wanted to be associated with. Let's, let's shut Chris up and, <laughs> and give him the X-Men. And that was wonderful on so many levels because uh, unlike when Stan was developing, you know, the early Marvel comics with Jack and Steve and Dick and Don and everyone else, uh, and, and there were sort of no rules, really, you know, other than the comics code and whatever Martin Goodman might like or not like. But, you know, they, they had like a lot of freedom to, to really have fun and do what they wanted. Once uh, around the time I, I entered uh, in the early 70s, there was a sense of, well, these books are, are important. These are the top sellers. And we got to make sure, you know, we preserve them and keep them going. But, you know, they only had so much energy. <laughs> so the books that were on the bottom, that's sort of where all the fun could happen. Yeah. Where, you know, they weren't yeah. really, you know, who cares? I mean, it's almost going right back to amazing fantasy. You know, like, okay, put your silly spider-man character <laughs> in that yeah. book we're going to cancel it anyway yeah. and uh, so it's the same thing so chris bless him was just full of energy enthusiasm and this was his opportunity to to make his mark and uh, likewise he you know he, he bonded very well with artist originally dave cockram mm -hmm. and they just you know they were pouring everything they had into it and they were pretty much being left alone. I'm sure there was some editorial stuff going on as well, but they, they were creating momentum. And and then when um, John Byrne took over, he's someone uh, I was aware of through, he was a fan artist. And at one point um, I had a roommate uh, when I was living in Brooklyn named Duffy Volan, who was uh, also came from comics fandom and um, also did a lot of inking. And one of the guys he inked a lot was uh, John Byrne early on. So he sort of helped John. You know, he would show John's work to the uh, editors at Marvel, and he started getting work. And eventually he was in a position where he and Chris were doing the X-Men. Everything about it was just incredible fun. You know, like uh, yeah. it was getting – you know, the kind of attention the X-Men was getting at the time or, uh, others in the company might have thought, well, those are, you know, those are the, the fans, you know, we have to, you know, Marvel has to worry about <laughs> the, uh, you know, the top books, you know, the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man and, and, and please that audience, you know, so, you know, the fans aren't going to be crazy about those books, but, you know, let them enjoy you know, the Fantastic Four, you know, like the, I mean, the X-Men and, uh, you know, it'll never be a big hit. So, you know, have fun while it lasts. And, uh, and even when I was, um, assistant editor to Roger Stern, I think one year I got to go out to, um, a UK con, uh, and they had a, a, probably, it was probably no more than 20, teenagers who had a little you know association and they would give out awards and they had the most impressive looking you know design for the eagle awards and it sounded great and you know and uh, i was there and i must have accepted something like seven <laughs> <laughs> eagle awards for the x-men and when i came back one of the things I, I was, uh, again, very lucky working with Roger Stern as uh, his assistant editor is that he had his hands full just editing all the titles that he was very generous to uh, let me work on putting the covers together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll interrupt myself to like, I literally remember as a kid uh, 
like Stan would always be writing, you know, like, you know, you know, don't, you know, go to your favorite uh, newsstands, you know, how haunt your newsstands, you know, for the next yeah. issue of Fantastic Four, whatever you were reading. And I felt like I literally did that. <laughs> I was, you know, I <laughs> this trip, there was no comic book stores back then. So in the Bronx, you know, the distribution was a little spotty. So I would, as a kid, go to different neighborhoods, like where, where can I find, you know, comics? And, and like, I, I would, you know, it was free as a kid to, sure. to go travel into all sorts of neighborhoods. One, uh, I'll, I'll get this out of the way quickly. One of the most... <laughs> moral conflicts i had to <laughs> test myself as a kid as my mom took me when i must have been 10 or 11 years old to visit one of her friends and um you know i must have looked bored or something to my mom's friend she said uh, oh why don't you go into my son's bedroom uh uh he has some comic books there and one of the comics i've been looking for everywhere was silver surfer number one it's a new 25 cent comic book not a regular size so i couldn't find it at any of the i go into that kid's room right by his bed there it <laughs> silver is. surfer number one i mean i knew that i probably could have said and i would have hated if anyone had done it to me so i didn't do it like hey can i uh can I have this comic? And maybe, oh, sure, he has plenty. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't do it. I was just, oh, my gosh. So at that point uh, in my life, I remember I had a weird dream that one of those dreams you wake up and you're like, was that real? Was that I, I, Did that happen? It takes a while to figure it out. And what it was is I had sort of gone into a different neighborhood I'd never explored before. And I went in and I saw the whole wall of comics in new Marvel comics. And there were like completed covers that didn't exist anywhere else other than in this dream, <laughs> in my imagination, <laughs> as if there was some production department in there that put together all these covers that like, you know, so it was just this weird, weird Living dream that, that stuck with me. So thanks to Roger Stern, when I got to work on covers, it was almost like now I get to be someone who gets to work with the artists and the, you know, and help, you know, design and write the cover copy, uh, all that kind of stuff. So I absolutely enjoyed it. So back to what I was saying, one of the things, I mean, previously, I think Roy Thomas once put on a cover, you know, like I think it was Conan. Yeah, you know, winner of the Academy of Comic Book Arts and Science Awards for you know, mm -hmm. you know best uh, comic book of the year. Uh, I think they named the, the awards the uh, Shazam Awards before Marvel brought back Shazam. No, before DC brought back yeah. Shazam, so Marvel couldn't call it that on the cover. But I thought, okay, you know, it was just a fun thing to do. You'd see. Movies do that in their advertising, you know, like winner of three Academy Awards or 10 Golden Globes. So I, I just figured it'll, it'll be fun to just put, you know, you know winner of uh, seven Eagle Awards or whatever it was. And uh, and I remember years later, because I, I, I was just smoke and mirrors. So I didn't really think it would have much of an impact one way or the other. But I remember overhearing uh, Gary Groth talking to Kim Thompson because um, they'd done the same thing. Those same probably 20 kids in England that grew up a few years and their new favorite comic was Love and Rockets. Uh -huh. So when Love and Rockets swept the Eagle Awards, you know, they put that on their cover too, but I don't think it had any impact on their sales and they were scratching their head. How come? We won the Eagle Awards and sales didn't go up. But <laughs> <laughs> they didn't get the X Men effect, unfortunately. No, but but I, I think it was it was many many factors. You know, like the distribution okay. of you know like uh, comics. X Men was you know uh, catching on. Kids were you know uh, enjoying you know all the uh, uh, innovations that uh, Chris and Dave and then John and and I think one of the other really key factors in what makes a lot of comics successful is just having the same creative team month after month, you know? Oh, 100%. I mean, yeah. Yeah. 
So how you so I mean down to you knew that Terry Austin was inking and Tom Orzakowski was lettering and Glennis Ween was coloring. It was, you know, if you liked one issue, chances are you'd like the next one and the next one. So, yeah. and it was it's just an exciting time. Nice. Uh, it's, uh, go ahead, Joe. Yeah. Now, I, I was going to say, I've heard, I don't know if you know this or not or can confirm this. When uh, Star Wars A New Hope came out, I, I heard that Claremont was the one who had to get tickets for people at the office or wait online for for that movie i don't remember i i, I know we got to see it uh uh one of the things uh that most people forget these days although you could you could look it up and you find out it's true and, and in a lot of ways uh, star wars was sort of kind of like one of the first marvel movies in this sense that the comic the Marvel adaptation, the Star Wars comic, came out, uh, I can't remember how many months before the movie. Yeah. So there was this big Marvel audience that was very excited about it, not, you know, not because it was a new movie coming out, but there was a new Marvel comic. It, you know, yeah. now there's a new Marvel comic every week. But back then, <laughs> it, it really was sort of a big deal. Yeah. And, you know, oh, this is exciting. And so I think, I'm sure Star Wars would have been a big success no matter what. But I think uh, there were a bunch of people involved promoting uh, the first Star Wars movie. Uh, I think Ed Summer was involved. There was a, another guy, I think, uh, Steve Sans, Sansfuit. I can't remember. Uh, who would go to conventions. There was like specific promotions that where they were going after the fan audience because this was at a point in time where the conventional wisdom in the movie industry was science fiction not commercial at all you, you want to make right. a movie that's going to be a box office bomb make a sci-fi movie so for star wars to open up on day one and there were lines <laughs> of fans. I think it was the combination of obviously all the promotion and publicity and advertising the studio did. But I think that the Marvel comic had, had a big impact as well, where people wanted, this was a chance to see something on the big screen that they had read in a comic book. You well, know, the last time that happened to me personally, when I was a, a kid in the 66, I guess, and I was reading this comic book that most adults didn't seem to be aware of some obscure character called Batman. Mm -hmm. And then it was going to become a TV show. And it was like, for a little kid, that's like, here's something that's part of my world. Batman. I know this Batman. It's going to be on TV. Sure. That was like the most exciting. Like that was a true event that was mind boggling. Something I know about, I didn't know about any of the other TV shows before they came out, but this, I, I knew about it. You know, that's, I want to see that. And so yeah. I think that same thing happened. Star Wars. I've well, been reading so. that. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to yeah. be a movie. I want to see it. I, I yeah, think it's great. It, it got, I mean, it was advertising in a sense, but it, it got into a lot of places. It got a feeling like there was a big pop culture phenomenon was about to hit and you're going to get a chance to read this and you'd, you'd always play out the adventures in your mind. But then you could go into a theater and see these things moving around. I mean, that would be a huge draw. Well, yeah. George Lucas was a, a smart guy, and yeah. uh, he he knew he probably went there. Like, there's all these deals that I look back on where you know it's all a matter of timing and knowing when to ask the right questions. And if he had gone. I think it was Alan Ladd Jr., whoever was in charge of the movie studio at the time, 20th Century Fox. Uh, and th they were convinced the Star Wars thing was, a, you know, they were just throwing money out the window. Yeah. And if Lucas came in and wanted, you know, another dollar, you know, like, forget it. You know, we, we just, <laughs> we're, we're not going to throw any more money after that. And uh, instead he said, uh, you know, you think? I could get the, the merchandising rights. <laughs> hey, yeah. George wants the merchandising rights to, to Star Wars. <laughs> Draw up a contract. 
Okay, George. <laughs> Happy. Good luck with that. <laughs> oh, that's and you know what happened since. Yeah. Y- you know, you um you took over as the full editor on on X-Men from Roger, what was it, like uh issue one thirty three? I think the one where Wolverine just murders a bunch of people. One thirty three. <laughs> Yeah, yes, it's, yeah, it's 133. <laughs> so no, no, 130, 132. Um, 132? Your list is the other, and that is the issue that has the right. five Eagle Awards on the cover. As oh, well. right, so, right. Yeah. Five. But, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah, then there's 133 is the one where Wolverine just murders everyone. Yeah. And then um, that at band, the, uh, Wolverine. <laughs> right. And then uh, I think your last one was 137 because it's you and uh, Wheezy at the time was going by Luis Jones. As like well, what, it, what had happened is uh, Louise was joining the, the Marvel staff, mm-hmm. and Jim Shooter was going around to the uh, existing editorial teams and asking them to uh, which book they were willing to give up uh, uh, for Louise. And um, a lot of them were like, you know, which is my least favorite? Uh, yeah, here, here, give, give her this one. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you want to keep the books you love. Uh, um, but at the time, when I took over from, from Roger, we were already doing the Avengers and all the books that tied into the Avengers, Iron Man, Thor, Captain America. We we're doing the Fantastic Four and the, you know, Marvel uh, uh, two-in-one. No, was it? Yeah, the, with the thing and team-up book. Yeah. And, and a whole bunch of other, plus X-Men, plus Marvel Premier, Marvel Spotlight. It was just a lot of books. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And I already had two teams, you know, uh, the FF and Avengers and uh, X-Men uh, just seemed to be something like, a, a, like a, a universe of its own. You know, there was so much going on in there and uh, there were so many, you know, things uh, and, 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 and Chris, was, uh, you know, this force of nature with all the things he wanted to do. And John had a million ideas. I mean, that could have been just a full-time job uh, yeah. handling, editing just that one title. Uh, so uh, the title I you know, was willing to give up was X-Men, uh, you know, and Jim was very happy about it. Jim Shooter, the editor in chief, because oh, that'd be great. You know, like everyone was, everyone else was giving her these books. Uh, she probably wouldn't be too excited about, but she'll probably be thrilled to to work on this, or so they thought. And uh, <laughs> at the uh, and and uh, what when I took over from it, I from the sidelines, I was sort of uh, noticing that. Uh, you know, Roger Stern, you know, in a weird way, you know, to, I, I don't want to sound critical in any way, but he was sort of like very close friends with the, or best friends possibly with, with John Byrne. Mm-hmm. So I think in a way, you know, whenever there was, uh, you know, any sort of conflict between Chris and John, Roger may have had a tendency, you know, Maybe he thought in his heart, you know, John was, you know, correct and would, would side with him a lot. And I, I sort of thought, well, when, you know, I'm, I'm neutral. <laughs> yeah. I like them yeah. both a lot, but, you know, I'll, I'll see what I can do. And uh, one of the things that happened, which, you know, if I thought just the books I was going to be taking over was a lot. Jim Shooter was the editor-in-chief at the time, and he was pretty much a very hands-on editor-in-chief for the whole line. Yeah. And I think, you know, none of us are perfect, but I think one of the things that happened as I've had years to, uh, you know, read other people's interviews and study what's been written about it is that I think Jim sort of forgot that when they went into the whole Dark Phoenix thing, that he originally had a meeting with uh, Chris Claremont and uh, Roger Stern, who was the editor. And I think he 
misremembered and thought that I was there. Because one of the things that they were talking about early on was the idea of taking uh, a good guy and turning that into a villain. Right. I wasn't privy to that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it never occurred to me that as an editor, I had the power to potentially kill off one of the original X-Men. I mean, that (laughs) I, I... no, you know, I just, the way, <laughs> yeah. you know, when you look at the, uh, Marvel did publish the version I edited, uh, they published it as, as a one shot, you know, the X- dark Phoenix, the untold story uh-huh. or something like that. And it had a big interview with all of everyone involved in, in the back of the book where you could see, we're sort of realizing, well, wait a minute. Didn't you say, you said that didn't <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how confusing it really was. But, uh, my thinking was simply that uh, some other entity had possessed Jean Grey and made her do all those naughty things. And once that was exercised from her, she was back to pure, innocent Jean Grey, and we could carry on from there. And uh, fortunately, you know, Jim was hands on. And I don't, and I think if my version was the one that saw print, we wouldn't be talking about it now. But because, you know, Jim insisted that, uh, you know, Dark Phoenix had a, had a pay, you know, somehow, I guess Wolverine could get away with murdering people. But the <laughs> Dark <laughs> Phoenix, on the other hand, killed all those broccoli people and, uh, and uh, <laughs> had, to, had to be punished for it. So, uh, but then again, I also thought, you know, like... Uh, how dead is a character called Phoenix ever going to stay? So sure. yeah, whole work out out to be correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, since you were talking about, uh, Roger Stern, John Byrne, you got to edit the two of them on Captain America for a uh, few issues or so there. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. And also, um, uh, Joseph Rubenstein, who I, I even went to, uh, you know, after that summer I started at, uh, at Marvel, I, I, I did, you know, I wanted to go to high school of art and design so I could someday work at Marvel, but I wound up working in Marvel and then going to the high school, of art design, <laughs> which was uh, one of my biggest regrets because I, you know, I was only 15, but uh, my comics knowledge of comics history wasn't uh, uh, as fully developed as in, you know, or, or where it is now. And there was a teacher there, Bernie Krigstein, who I who I did meet and talk to a little bit, uh, but I really wasn't aware of what a true original and such a comics innovator he was. And he was right there. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, you can't, can't do everything, but uh, Joe was uh, uh, also uh, a student there and we became good friends. And uh, I, I, you know, while Terry was a, uh, Absolutely. Terry Austin, a great inker over John, a great inker over anyone. Uh, Joe Rubenstein was uh, also uh, in a different, a different approach, more in the uh, Neil Adams esque, you know, school of inking, perhaps. And I felt that gave John's work a different look, which, uh, which was great on, on Captain America. And I thought they did some wonderful stories. Okay. One of the uh, things, unfortunately, that occurred is that I was still, relatively uh, new as an editor and uh, the way I've always tried to work uh, and still work is that if I'm working for someone, if I'm working for an editor, if I'm working for a publisher, an editor in chief, whatever it is, uh, I feel that's my challenge. I have to please them if I want to keep my job, but I also want to please myself. So how can I give whoever that person is, what they want, while at the same time doing things that I want. And and it it, it makes it creatively interesting for me to be able to do that. So a lot of times, and I think this this is advice for anyone, (laughs) if you're working for someone, in general, if they give you a specific directive, 
chances are they're going to remember that. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, it's probably in your own best interest to make sure you do whatever that is. And, and, and as a result, there may be a whole bunch of other things they're not paying attention to that you could do. But it would be a mistake to blatantly not do the one thing that they're asking for. And one of Jim Shooter's goals around that time was as editor-in-chief for the whole line to, in his mind, uh, you know, restore a sort of order that would make all the titles as accessible to new readers as possible. And one of the things that he thought, you know, was probably making it difficult for new readers was almost every title and there was a lot of titles back then, was an ongoing, sort of never-ending, continuing epic. Yeah. So everyone would, you know, who's a new reader, you pick something up, you feel like you're walking into the middle uh, of a movie, and you don't know what the relationships are, who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, et cetera, et cetera. And one of his solutions was, you know, sort of like, why don't we take a break, go back, to the early days of Marvel, where we're doing one part stories. You know, someone picks it up, there are yeah. very clear, defined introductions. This is this guy, here's the other guy, they live here, they do this, here comes the villain, here's what he wants, you know, and even have a conclusion in one issue. It's shocking. And yeah. uh, it was a whole, and you know, he was trying to be reasonable. So he said, okay, there could be two parters, you know, make sure they're good. You know, make sure they're clear. Make sure if someone picks up the second part, you know, the reader will know what happened before. And then he extended it to, now, if you want to do a three-parter, it merely has to be as good as the Galactus trilogy. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Which at that time was held up as one of the yeah. you know, classics uh, from Marvel and Stanley and Jack Kirby. So... But uh, so that's so really for me. Yeah. So, so the rap, you know, so yeah. basically it became a, I think Stan, uh, I think uh, Roger and John were planning to do a two or three part thing. And I was saying, no, 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 we got to do one part stories. If I had it to do over again, uh, I think what I could have done in, in retrospect was say, look, Put this three-parter aside for now, you know, because they had done a bunch of one-part stories. You know, let's let's you know, let's just continue doing one and two-part stories. And when Jim gets off this kick, <laughs> which eventually he did, uh, then we'll run that three-parter. But I think uh, at the time they were in the midst of it, and they they wanted to do what they wanted to do, and uh, uh, I wasn't about to, uh, you know go against Jim at that point. So, so he sort of were at loggerheads and they felt that's it. We quit. And, um, you know, I, I maintained, a, I hope a good friendships and relationships with them, everyone on it. Uh, the odd thing was this was many, many, many years later. I'm talking with Joe Rubenstein and he says, when, when Stern and Byrne quit, how come I wasn't, on the next issue. I never quit. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <That's> Joe. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it, there, there's, it was just so many things going on at the time. Well, but they did a great job. They did great stuff. They both continue yeah. to do great stuff. Uh, with John, we went on together to do uh, Fantastic Four, which I absolutely love. Roger yeah. always had tons of things to do. One little project he uh, we worked on that very few people know about, which I'll reveal now, uh, was uh, uh, another friend of mine from high school, Sal De Niro, wound up working at uh, Henson Associates. He was a very talented, you know, guy who could build puppets and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, oh, you know, this is back when newspapers were still big and all that. I said, wouldn't it be cool to come out with a uh, Muppets comic strip? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I thought, well, Roger, he, he was able to write funny stuff. And I thought he could write it. 
and, and I, uh, I thought potential artists uh, would be uh, there. Was, I still have the strips that uh, Roger, John Byrne, and Terry Austin did for a Muppets comic strip. And Marie Severin did some samples also uh, that Roger wrote. And we were involved, you know, for quite a few years with uh, trying to pitch this to um, uh, the Muppets. I had wonderful meetings with Jim Henson and, you know, all the top people there. They loved what we did. We only hit a snag when we ran into a King Feature Syndicate where the uh, guys who were in charge back then were uh, – older fellas <laughs> mm -hmm. and there was one particular guy that was who was i think just a consultant who they they listened to who was uh, really old and and uh, he kept referring to the muppets as 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 the muppets the <laughs> no <laughs> and a lot of the stuff that uh, we were doing was we wanted you know uh, and this has been my approach with all the comics I edit, if something, whether it's a licensed property or an ongoing property, if something has been successful for any length of time, I try to be faithful as much as uh, possible. You know, so if someone liked it on TV or movies or as a toy, whatever, we try to get those same ingredients, make sure that's going to be in the, in the comics. And so as a result, you know, there were things where, in this comic strip, they were the characters were you know like on the Muppets TV show, breaking the fourth wall, you know, you know having mm -hmm. it was just very clever stuff. I mean, it was just incredibly well done. And unfortunately, at that point, uh, it's as if the whole philosophy of King Features was sort of set by you know this Mort Walker guy is God. <laughs> Anything he touches is a big success for us. And it's true. I mean, like his strips are, you know, he's long gone, but he's, uh, those strips are still very successful. Okay. And so he wanted something closer, you know, to Beetle Bailey or High and Lois. And, 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 and Mort had recommended some uh, great cartoonists who uh, wound up, a uh, guy and Brad Gilchrist, who wound up doing a very good job on it. So I, no hard feelings, but, uh, but, as a result of that relationship, uh, Marvel wound up doing all sorts of things with the uh, the Muppets people, and uh, I got to work on some of those projects, and it even led to uh, Marvel Productions doing M Muppet Babies, and then it all came mm -hmm. full circle again back to uh, Marvel publishing a Muppet Babies comic strip that Marie Severin absolutely loved the, Mupp the Muppets, and she loved working on that, so it was, it was great to see. Nice. Um, I think people forget that that was a property that uh, Marvel was working with long before the whole Disney relationship. This was actually part of that DNA. They, they were all, <laughs> yeah, it was exactly. all connected. You know, Star Wars and Marvel. You know, Marvel and Star Wars. You know, Disney, Marvel. It, it, they're all finally, it's all one. It's. Uh, I, I'm struck by something you said a minute ago um, in terms of this idea where Jim Shooter was wanting to get books. They wanted to provide jumping on points for people. They wanted to make it accessible for people. But um, the plan there, if I'm hearing you right, was let's make the stories kind of one and done. Let's let's give somebody the value of whatever the story is going to be in the comic. They weren't, uh, were they suggesting at the time, let's restart everything because people can't count high or anything like that? Nothing? No. no yeah. No, nothing. <laughs> it was more, uh, no, that would have been unthinkable at that point. Yes. But uh, recently, uh over the last couple of years, I've been writing uh, uh, introductions for various uh, Marvel masterworks, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, which uh, I had been with Marvel for 27 years when they asked me back, and uh, I said, yeah, "Sure, of course." Yeah. And uh, some of the the, the volumes, uh, you know, recently it was a Captain America volume uh, that I think Roger Stern had edited most of the stories, and there was a couple of volumes of Avengers. And when they first asked me, uh, you know, my usual answer when asked most things is yes. And uh, as long as it's not illegal or something bad, <laughs> uh, I, was, I, I was happy to do it. But in the back of my mind, I was like, over the years, they're, they're, it's sort of like a string of greatest hits that I'm always 
asked about. Right. And I was asked to write these introductions for, for, you know, comics that I hadn't thought about in, <laughs> in decades. And uh, so fortunately they sent me, uh, was it my collection is inaccessible it's in storage, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, they sent me, uh, you know, PDFs of all the stories that were going to be collected. And I got to reread them again and, and uh, it, it was a fun process because I think in a lot of ways, uh, Jim Shooter is uh, uh, for people who, only, who, who, who focus on the writing, I think they have a greater appreciation for him. But yeah. I think comics fans in general are, are more susceptible to the artwork. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, J.M., uh, I called him Dematis for years. Now he's going mm -hmm. back to Dematis. Uh, uh, he, he often says very uh, modestly when people interview him about uh, uh, Craven's Last Hunt, they'll say, you know, how do you explain the enduring success? You know, like he's too modest to say, because it was my great story. <laughs> he'll say, <laughs> he'll, he'll very truthfully say, uh, and give a lot of credit to Mike Zeck. Sure. And, and he'll say, uh, and I, I think there's a lot of truth to this. He says, it could have gone to a different artist. It could have had all the exact same words and the exact same story. And it could have been completely forgotten. It, and, and one of the ways I try to explain that to people is like, say you take a classic Shakespeare play and you do one version where it's cast with the greatest living actors imaginable. And you do another version where it's like a, a third grade class where the kids are just, right. it's the exact same script. <laughs> yep. You know, this version is laughable. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the other one is like, you know, it, 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 it's, it's inspirational. It, 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 it inspire. It's like, you can't believe how brilliant it is. Uh, yep. and, and the same thing sort of happens with comics. So when I was looking at a lot of uh, uh, those stories, uh, Avengers stories by Jim, I thought, you know, like this, this is like such a great story. Uh, not because of my editing, uh, you know, it, yeah. it, it, uh, it, but, and, and the artwork, it, you know, I don't want to denigrate the artist. It was, being a comic book artist is, is a, an incredibly difficult task to begin sure. with. And particularly on a team book, you know, like you'll have the exceptional artists such as George Perez, John Byrne and others who actually enjoyed <laughs> drawing as many characters as possible. But for a lot of other car uh, artists, uh, it was like, Oh yeah, you know, this is overwhelming. You know, just to put down what was required. Just to yeah. meet the, the minimum, you know, like, okay, this page is this, this, is this, is this. Like, and, and one of the things, it was a story, I can't remember, Joe probably remembers what you did, maybe you do. <laughs> there was one with the, you know, one of the, there was a, a lot of those yellow jacket stories, Jim, uh -huh. that, that were really great. And there was one that had this, you know, the yellow jacket was already kicked out of the Avengers. Mm. And poor Hank Pym is like, huh, he's like, He's desperate, you know, I'll do anything to sort of get back in the good graces and, you know, get back with the, the wasp, et cetera, et cetera. And one of his old foes uh, with the unfortunate name of Egan, yeah. yes. which I think right away, you know, at that time, you know, brought back memories of Vincent Price and the campy Batman <laughs> TV show, yes. which I loved. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But sort of works against doing a very serious uh, story in, in the Avengers and, and, you know, and the artist drew sort of, you know, in his style, the, you know, traditional version of Egghead and all that. But, and as I was looking at this story, which I thought was brilliant and wonderful, and I couldn't help but thinking like, you know, when Frank Miller was doing Daredevil, he didn't take sort of the, the cartoony John Romita senior kingpin, you know, jolly roly poly guy with his, you know, uh, cigarette uh, you know, holder and 
and mm-hmm. you know all his you know he, he sort of recreated the character it was still the kingpin but somehow he made it work in this new daredevil uh, universe he was sort of creating where he was sort of reinventing all the characters making them a little darker and you know yeah you know, so so <laughs> if if a John Romita senior, nothing against John senior, uh, mm-hmm. Kingpin had showed up in that version of Daredevil, you know, it would have looked ridiculous. It would have looked yeah. like that might had popped into uh, <laughs> you know, Dark Knight or something. But by re, you know, it recreated the mood and the context and and made you take this character far more seriously than you would have. Uh, in the earlier version. So I think, uh, you know, a long way to go to, you know, like what, what Jim was doing, he was doing a lot of, uh, one part stories, but there was continuity, you know, in other words, there was a complete, you know, uh, story there, but it followed events that had happened before. So there still was continuity. There just wasn't that sense of, uh, always a cliffhanger you know i think yeah in yeah. all fairness there were way too many stories like the first couple of times you, you read a, a marvel comic and, and you're shocked one of the classic ones was an issue of x-men by roy thomas and neil adams and tom palmer where you go through the whole issue and then at the end you realize the villain was magneto he didn't have yeah. his helmet on the whole story in the last page you see there's his helmet it's Magneto. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, how many stories where writers would just be, you know, they have to crank out so many scripts every every month and like, okay, you know, like uh, get to the last page. Oh, it's Doc Ock. Oh, it's, you know. Mm-hmm. Eh. I, I think, <laughs> I think uh, Jim was tr- not only trying, I think what he was trying to do is pull it back and try to elevate the level of writing in all the series and and part part of that was to enforce, you know, giving more stories. And I think in that Avengers, uh, there were a lot of fill-ins as well. And some of them were by some very talented people who were just starting. And uh, you could see the difference in, in the sense that some people, when they thought one, you know, one issue story – and particularly if it was designed to be a, a filling, uh, in all fairness, you know, would sort of start at, at point A, have some stuff happen, they defeat the villain, and at the end, you're right back to the status quo. Right. It's just a little circle of a story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think Jim was advocating, if you could judge by the stories he was, 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 was writing, that you could have something happen. Yeah. But... Give some sense of, of, of a resolution. Okay. You know, in that particular story, Egghead, you know, succeeded. He, he completely, you know, tricked uh, Hank Pym into doing something. And, you know, and he winds up being arrested. Yep. End of story. Next story can pick up where that left off or, or not. No, it's, it's, it's not, uh, you're not telling meaningless stories. I think that's maybe where some people's heads go sometimes and they hear one and done. They think maybe they put too much emphasis on the done, but it's, yeah. it's more that you're getting a complete read in a comic. You're getting a full experience for the comic you bought. You're not getting a one third of a story and you're not getting something meaningless either. It's that middle ground that I think one done right. It's very successful. Yeah. Let me go. Give- uh, Joe had mentioned Mark Runewald before. Let yeah, me give yeah. him uh, some real credit for, because when I was looking and studying these stories recently, when I had to write that introduction, what I did wrong looking back on it is I looked at it as, because uh, like I said earlier, I, I put so much um, emphasis on trying to have a regular creative team. So I wanted Jim Shooter to be writing every issue, Mm -hmm. which was very unrealistic, you know, to expect from the guy who's also the editor in chief at Marvel. I mean, he has his hands full and and that job doesn't automatically 
cut off at five o'clock. At you know, he had he had a lot of stuff to be doing. So the fact that he wrote as many issues as he did, and they were as good as they were, is, is rather impressive to me. But what I, you know, what I would do is uh, obviously, uh, I, I, you know, became aware this is you know, not going to work out the way I want. So I would have lots of fill-ins, and a lot of them were. In some cases, you know, just finding people who were available, or in some cases, new writers, giving them an opportunity to break in, et cetera, et cetera. Mark, I think, had a much better way of dealing with the uh, Jim Shooter issue in that I think Mark was more than happy to have Shooter write as many issues as he could. But I think Mark, and anyone who knew them would know this is true, had so many ideas himself about individual characters and where they are and what they're doing and what their status of that he took this as a great opportunity. For example, okay, Jim's going to do these couple issues. I could I could put a uh, an issue in here that brings that that's almost a, a Hawkeye solo issue. Yeah. Or Hawkeye and Ant Man together, or I could do another issue in here where we bring back or resolve the uh, continuity with the Black Knight, and and he was, it's almost like he was having more fun with those in between issues, and making them special in his uh, in another way, which I, I really thought, you know, I smacked my forehead, you know. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? That was uh, a brilliant uh, decision by Grunewald. And, uh, uh, he, you know, he did a very, you know, very good job, you know, coming up with that. And, and so, like, making each issue have something uh, special as opposed to just, you know, treading water when I would run fill in. So, live and, and learn. And you, um, you, you gave a lot of people uh, uh, a shot, some of their early published work. I think... Uh, you gave Kyle Baker his first Marvel gig, right? Yeah, I think uh, I'll give. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was editing um, Marvel Age, and uh, uh, I think Kurt Busick was my assistant at the time. So to be totally mm -hmm. fair, I think even though I like Kyle's work, I think uh, uh, Kyle. Uh, I think Kurt came up with. Uh, I think we may have come up with it together. I was like, uh, we were brainstorming. Uh, uh, I wanted Marvel Age to be as successful as possible, even though you know many people just saw it as uh, advertising for the rest of the Marvel line. You know, I wanted it to have a real identity of its own. I wanted it to be fun. I would. I was always involved as soon as I could. You know, I was involved with the. Uh, Foom after Starenko was no longer working on it. Uh, uh, you know, all that stuff. I, I, I wanted there to be, uh, you know, some house organ or, or, or really a fan club magazine where people could enjoy stuff. And one of the things I thought was uh, maybe we could have a section in every issue because the X-Men stuff was so successful. And um, I can't remember whether it was me or Kurt. And I said, it could be like a little pseudo newspaper. <laughs> we'll call it the, the mutant report and it'll be in every issue and it'll give us a chance to write about what's, what's just going on in, in the various mutant titles. And I think it was Kurt who probably thought, well, it's sort of this little newspaper format, you know, for three or four pages. Uh, why not have like a, a one panel gag cartoon? Uh, which I think Kurt named also It's Genetic and, mm -hmm. and used it as an excuse to work with uh, either have Kyle write and draw it himself or sometimes Kurt would come up with the gags. Or, and so so Kyle was doing that and, uh, and then he was doing all – and suddenly he was uh, doing all sorts of other things. I think uh, – not one, but, but I think – independently from Marvel. Uh, I mean, Kyle gives me credit for giving him his, his first assignment, but I think around the same time he had independently gotten uh, uh, a graphic, a cowboy Wally <laughs> graphic mm -hmm. novel published. Nice. I mean, anyone who was around Kyle, you know, could see this was uh, this guy's an exceptional talent. So, uh, you know, whenever I had the opportunity, I, I tried to give him work and even, 
when I was editing Spider-Man, he would ink covers or do whatever I could squeeze into his schedule. And uh, even at Paper Cuts, there are a couple of Kyle Baker uh, stories and, uh, uh, and, and covers, you know. So he, whenever I could, uh, whenever there is an opportunity, I mean, he's, he's done covers for um, uh, when we relaunched uh, a new Tales from the Crypt comic. Uh, you know, Kyle did a cover for it. He was going through what he called a Jack Davis phase. Mm. And there were a couple of stories in uh, our, we did a bunch of titles uh, based on Nickelodeon properties. And, uh, and mm. uh, one of them, uh, he did a story that was, uh, <laughs> he said, he wrote and drew it. He said, uh, I think it was a Gumby story, actually. Okay. And, uh, we did a volume of Gumby and Kyle wrote and drew one where uh, the character was almost a uh, takeoff on, uh, on Venom. Mm. You can imagine that in Gumby. But yeah, so <laughs> Kyle is, I can't imagine that in Gumby, actually. Great, great, yeah. great pleasure to work with him, and I hope to continue working. He's, he's incredible. You, I, um, you also, you're, you're credited with, um, you know, thinking that this, uh, this guy, Todd McFarlane, might do a good Spider-Man. There was a, a bunch of people who uh, recognized uh, Todd's talents. Uh, uh, this also happened during... Uh, that point where some of the Marvel's top talents were having their rate of differences with uh, Jim Shooter. So there seemed like a lot of people were jumping ship going from uh, Marvel where they had a lot of success to suddenly, you know, the new, new kid on the block at, uh, at DC. Uh, Todd was a very astute, smart fellow. And he saw that and he was already at DC and, um, he was thinking, well, maybe when all those guys are coming to DC, maybe I could go to Marvel. And part of what his frustration was, and it's, and, and if you saw his uh, pencils on this, uh, you'd, you'd understand, is he sort of got like this really wonderful opportunity to be the artist on Batman Year Two. Yep. And again, nothing against the great and wonderful Alfredo Alcala. But they chose him as the anchor. Excuse me for a second. Yep. And uh, Alfredo, absolutely wonderful artist in and of his uh, in his own right. And Marvel used him particularly well, even if John Buscema might have not liked it that much. But uh, when he was one of the uh, artists inking or embellishing John Buscema's work in the black and white Savage Sword Conan magazine. And Alcala had this very Lion Decker inspired style with all this detail and just great beauty. And it, it, it worked so well in black and white uh, mm -hmm. where you could appreciate his line work. Uh, but what it did is Alfredo was sort of conditioned to believe that when he was given work, you know, it was his job to bring it to, you know, completion and, and finish it in his, in his style. Right. Yeah. So for a young artist trying to get some attention, Todd had done these very interesting pencils that screamed Todd McFarlane. And when they gave it to Alfredo, that was all gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Suddenly yeah. it was... You know, it was maybe different layouts, uh, designs of the pages than you would expect from Alfredo, but the finished art was very much his, and, and I'm sure that was very frustrating for Todd. Oh, yeah. So yeah. when he came to uh, Marvel, and again, to uh, give credit to that great guy, Mark Grunewald, who was executive editor at the time, uh, he took him around to see all the editors. At that point... I had uh, long, I'd been away from uh, editing a whole line of books for a while. I was editing Marvel Age and, you know, doing a bunch of freelance things, uh, writing all sorts of crazy things. And, uh, uh, but I, it, I had just gone back on staff to edit the line of Spider Man titles. And one of the things, I wanted to do, and this is touches on what I was saying before. I want 
whatever I'm working on to be as much that character as possible. Mm -hmm. And I felt, and this was a tricky thing. I, I really didn't like the black and white costume, even though it was very successful. I felt it, it looked like a villain to me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, and this was a tricky thing. I, I, so I asked Jim, uh, Shooter, the editor in chief, uh, who was the guy responsible for bringing that black and white costume, you know, into the, the you know, Spider Man. And one of the things, and I, I totally understood his, his reasoning, and I, I, I almost feel bad for ruining it, is uh, he wanted to keep that costume a lot longer. He wanted it to be around past the point where fans, you know, cynical fans would think, oh, they're just going to go back to the red and blue any day. And uh, he wanted to keep it around for years. And then, then probably once they all thought, well, that's it. <laughs> I guess yeah. that's Spider-Man's costume. And then he'll go back to it. But <laughs> when I approached him and I explained that I wanted to go back to it, you know, he told me what he wanted to do. And, I, you know, I mean, he could have said no. And I would have uh, listened, but uh, he said, you're the Spider-Man editor. You want to go back to the red and blue? Reluctantly, he said, yes. I said, yay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I, I already got the okay. And then when this new artist, Todd McFarlane, had come up to Marvel, Mark Grunewald was taking him around to all the different editorial offices, introducing him to the editors in each show these wonderful um, Batman year two pencil samples he had photocopies of. And everyone, you know, loved his work. I think a lot, everyone wanted to give him work. And I think uh, through that day, uh, he was probably, he probably got a G.I. Joe story to do. Yeah. A, uh, he was assigned the Incredible Hulk, you know, with Peter David. Uh, and when he came into my office with Mark, it's a Todd McFarlane you wouldn't recognize today. He, he was this very, he was like, you know, he was, he was sitting in my office, you know, head down, sort of mumbling a lot and, uh, you know, and very, you know, you know, it just seemed very modest. And, but, but, but surprisingly, <laughs> he had like a, a, a sort of a condition, you know, like here's this new artist coming in and, you know, if you offer him Spider-Man, the when she said, "Well, I, I really only want to do it if he has the red and blue costume." Now he didn't know I had already gotten the okay to do that, so I said, "Sure thing, you got it." We're <laughs> <laughs> and so worked we, it worked out uh, far better than we could have ever imagined, and uh, he was an absolute uh, joy to work with. Uh, uh, I remember having uh, an after hours call with Todd and uh, we were just discussing uh, our, 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 our approaches uh, to the work we were doing. And, uh, you know, he sort of had, it wasn't an argument, but it was just like we were, uh, he, we, I think we were both very competitive individuals where we wanted to be as successful as possible. You know, we didn't only want to do great work. We wanted, we wanted it to do well. And in sure. all the years I'd been at Marvel at that point, you know, I'd been around, uh, you know, some time and, you know, developed all sorts of, you know, theories. And, and it goes right back to what I was saying before about having a, a regular creative team uh, right. being so, so crucial. And, um, and he was like thinking, you know, he was trying to see Spider-Man. Well, maybe that's a stepping stone. And he was like uh, a lot of people at that time, the X-Men was seen as the, the pinnacle at Marvel. You know, that's, if you want to be super successful with the fans, you have to do something that's like, if not the X-Men itself. And uh, as someone who remembered, <laughs> <laughs> how X-Men went from something that was almost considered a joke, that book won't last, to becoming, at that point when I was editing um, 
Spider-Man, you know, the top title at Marvel for the past, you know, 10 years oh, or yeah. more. I said, no, 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 we could, we could do it with Spider-Man. And I remember I, I told him I had a seven year plan and, and a lot of the main part of it was make sure we're on, you know, this, we keep the same team month after month and, and then we'll have lots of fun developing all sorts of incredible stuff that I think fans will get excited about because in its own weird way, uh, the Spider-Man titles for uh, a certain period of time were almost taken for granted. You know, like uh, they weren't any longer the top sellers, but right. you know, there, was, there were several a month and they always did well. So it wasn't even crazy that, that, that they would have, they would try out new people on their top, you know, it would have been unthinkable, you know, to have like uh, fill-ins by people you never heard of on the X-Men. <laughs> right. You know, that, that right. was, that was everything had fully changed. You know, now the X-Men, was the uh, the crown jewel, and all these other titles, you know, like they figured, you know, they figured, well, Spider Man's always going to be around, and uh, you know, so if we assign some fill in, you know, there'll always there'll always be some, you know, issue of Spider Man somewhere we could, you know, slot it in. So uh, one of the first things I did when I was uh, editor of Spider-Man was use up as many of those, you know, villains as possible to get them out of the way while I stole for time to figure out what we wanted to do with Spider-Man. But anyway, Todd agreed to do it. And, uh, and, and he, you know, made that commitment to me. And uh, uh, I think it worked out very well. One of the things um, that made him at one point feel a little uncomfortable but, you know, it was his own fault. Um, there was some controversy that uh, because, uh, you know, Todd, you know, was drawing the webbings like he had seen Michael Golden draw them yep. uh, in, in a portfolio somewhere. And, you know, he made Spider-Man's eyes bigger and he added more webs and et cetera, et cetera. He's, you know, you know, so I was under pressure from the editor in chief, you know, like, uh, you know, have him draw Spider-Man the right way. What the hell's going on here, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> you know, get rid of that schmageggy uh, webbing and blah, 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 blah. So Man. my assistant editor at the time was a very talented young guy, uh, Glenn Herdling. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we had arranged a, a lunch meeting. Uh, Todd was going to be coming into town with his wife, uh, his lovely wife, Wanda. And, um, so it was, the lunch was the four of us, uh, myself, my assistant, Glenn Herdling, Wanda, and Todd. And the three of them <laughs> were almost ganging up on me and that they all sort of uh, loved what Todd was doing, and I did as well. And interestingly, the, the only problem I had with um, Todd's version is that I was – one of the things that was very, very important to me uh, was I, 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 in taking over after multiple titles every month with Spider-Man, I wanted there to be no doubt there was only one Spider-Man. I mean, before, it's almost as if they were dividing it up, you know, like, we'll put his uh, yeah. personal life in this title. We'll put his professional life at the Bugle in this title. We'll put... You know, like uh, his, the Marvel team up type stories in this time. It was, it, it was almost as if he had a different girlfriend in each title. It was, it was just, uh, and, and the continuity was always going forward yeah, in each that. title. If you were just reading, they wanted it to, you know, to be fair, if, if someone only read one of those books, that they'd be able to understand it. But in my mind, the ultimate solution, which they still are too cowardly to do, but they should do it, is uh, make Amazing Spider-Man a weekly comic. Yeah. You know, fans oh. go to the, you know, if you want however many Marvel spider you know, however many Spider-Man comics Marvel wants a month. Yeah, just make the one. You know, there'd be one a week, and it would be Amazing Spider-Man, and the stories would just always go forward, like, you know, how the way people are watching TV series and everything else now, yeah. you know, let, let's, because, you know, so that was crucial to me, but mm -hmm. 
I, I sort of derailed myself yet again. No, no, it's but, funny. It's good. Say but but uh, I, I was saying I wanted Spider Man to be uh, to be Spider Man, and we were talking about uh, Todd coming in for that lunch meeting, and uh, so what I was thinking was, you know, there more even then Marvel had actors who would appear at promotions and conventions or what have you in a Spider-Man costume. Mm -hmm. So what I was thinking, you know, to keep with this idea that there's only one Spider-Man is that, well, he should look like the same guy in each of his titles. You know, I mean, theoretically there could be a costume. Well, obviously there could be a costume based on Todd's design that would have bigger eyes, more webbing. And, since that's what was popular, my solution when all was said and done at this meeting was you convinced me. I, I like the, the look, you know, it's sort of shades of when <laughs> Julie Schwartz took over uh, Detective Comics and had a new look Batman. So this was like going to be my slightly new look, uh, you know, Spider-Man. Yeah. And one of the things I wanted to do was uh, have Sal Buscema, who was the artist on Spectacular Spider-Man, you know, draw this costume the same way, and Alex Saviak, who was doing Web of Spider-Man also. And Todd was like, oh, oh, no, I don't want you telling other artists, you know, like this is a nightmare suddenly to Todd. I don't want you, you know, telling other anyone else to draw like me. And I had to clarify, no, I'm not going to ask them to draw in your style. I want them as if this was a real costume, Sal Buscema can draw it in his style. Alex can draw it in his style. But I want all three of you drawing the same guy. You know, I want him to, you know, uh, that was crucial to me. So, uh, you know, and he, he was pretty understanding about that. And, uh, uh, and, and it all worked out, uh, I think, well for everyone concerned. Nice. And, um, you know, I, th I don't think we can talk about Todd and you and Spider-Man without also mentioning Venom. And uh, Venom wasn't always supposed to be Eddie Brock and this big bulky, like that wasn't always the plan, right? Depends on who you ask. But uh, mm -hmm. if you ask me, I mean, going back to what I was saying about not liking uh, the black and white costume, there was a point where... Uh, we had a, a changing of the guard uh, at the editor-in-chief level where Jim Shooter was leaving and uh, and Tom DeFalco was coming in. And this was a opportunistic guy that I could be at times, was a, a moment where I, I, you know, seized the opportunity to uh, while there was in the, in the ensuing chaos where, uh, where I, I got to put into play my idea of, like, what, you know, maybe I could do, you know, Craven's Last Hunt as a weekly mm -hmm. Spider-Man story. Have it run through all three titles and have another story that also ran through um, all three titles. And, uh, you know, I was able to do it before they noticed. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> that right. But one of the things when Tom came in as editor-in-chief, uh, I'd already, you know, like Marvel, you know, rightly so, likes to have special events occur in certain landmark issues, you know, 300th issue of Amazing Spider-Man. So Shooter was was uh, more or less happy I mean, <laughs> with me going back to the red and blue costume and, and, and that, you know, I explained earlier how he probably would have liked it if I did it in the, 600 issue instead but uh he, he gave the okay for it that it was well underway uh, now david michelini uh as far as the alien costume was concerned he had already been planning a storyline i think you're referring to joe that uh, was going to have a woman inside the alien costume yeah mm -hmm. and i i remembered that uh but when I was called in by Tom DeFalco, who was my, my new boss, who I had to please, uh, he, he asked me, uh, what do you plan for Amazing uh, Spider-Man 300? You know, he had to get to know what was going on in the, book, in the books he was at editor chief of. And so I explained, oh, we're going to be going back to the red and blue costume. And uh, to my surprise, uh, Tom said, that's not enough. 
Oh, oh no. Or <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, what else would you like, sir? And uh, he explained, uh, introduce a major new Spider-Man villain. Yeah. And you know, as if it's like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There's I mean, all up problem. until that point, most of the, you know, I, I would say the majority of the major Spider-Man uh, villains, super villains, were all created by Stan Lee, Steve Ditko, and John Romita. You know, yeah. there weren't a lot of people, uh, you know, I mean, even with David and Todd, uh, we had introduced a bunch of new villains, but, you know, uh, can, can you even mention any of them? Yeah, can you remember? <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy to do. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, okay, I'll try. We'll give it our best shot. And uh, one of the things that I, I had a good memory of uh, David wanting to, you know, bring the black and white costume back on a woman. And I thought, this could be my opportunity. I hated that black and white outfit so much. This could be a way to get rid of it permanently. <laughs> if, if we, if we put it on the villain, we make this a really nasty, horrible villain, but I, I wasn't, I, I think if it wasn't the 300th issue, if it was just a regular issue, I would have not interfered at all with David's plans to have it be on a woman, et cetera, et cetera. But because I got this, uh, just like when I was editing Captain America, the boss says, we want one part stories. We're going to have one part. Boss says he wants a major new Spider-Man villain. I'm going to do everything I can to make that happen, uh, even though I didn't think I could, honestly. And, uh, and I thought maybe it's sexist of me, but, you know, because since they, they have had the costume on uh, females. Mm -hmm. But uh, I thought, you know, a, Villains, you want someone who looks as threatening as, you know, like if you could have it be a guy who's like way bigger, you know, than, than Spider-Man, you know, just like if you could put the costume on the Hulk, you know, yeah. <laughs> this, yeah. that, that's, yeah. that's what I wanted. But one of the tricks you learn as an editor, and you read about this with the uh, lawyers as well, trial lawyers, the, uh, you know, it's a cliche, I guess, you know, that they never ask a question they don't already know the answer to. Yeah. So wanting to remain, you know, you know, my, my writer's advocate, you know, I, I said uh, to David that I went into, you know, Tom with this crazy idea, you know, like for the 300 issue. I mean, normally I wouldn't have gone back to Tom at all, but I was sort of a, uh, using him for my own sinister purposes because I knew he would say, no, no, no. We don't want Spider-Man fighting a woman, you know, have it, have it be a real big, nasty, scary looking guy, you know, yeah. and uh, no specifics. So when I, so up until that point, David's plan for amazing 300 only was to have, you know, uh, the return to the red and blue costume. I was, uh, because of Tom's request and, and thinking of something, what can work into what we're already doing as opposed to scrapping the plans and trying to shoehorn some guy showing up, if it could be related somehow to the story we're already working on, that, that it would be best. And I sort of laid it out to David that, you know, let's, instead of a woman, I, 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 I I did try mentioning that to Tom, but he rather have a big, big tough guy in there. You know, let's make that the villain. And everything else was David. You know, he came up with the plot. He, he, the whole Eddie Brock thing, the name Venom, even though uh, Don McGregor had a P Black Panther villain named Venom with two M's. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, David pretty much came up with what, what is now to be considered uh, 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 Venom. Uh, the the uh, 
it was a very detailed plot. You know, he, David, you know, like the, you hear a lot about Marvel style and, and could run the gamut from writers and artists just having conversations to, uh, you know, writers such as David Michelinie or Doug Mensch or, or, you know, where it may as well be a full script. I mean, it's that much yeah. detail. It's a page by page, almost panel by panel breakdown. And, you know, Todd drew it. And Todd even uh, will readily uh, admit that he didn't even realize there was a human being inside it, you know, when he first drew it. So he, he just thought it was a complete alien being. Yeah. So he had the teeth and the tongue. Uh, he didn't do the tongue as long as, as it is now. Uh, Eric Larson wound up yeah, he, going he crazy with the long yeah. tongue. <laughs> but... Uh, so Todd was more or less here, draw this. And again, this goes back to what I was saying, you know, like you could have anyone draw something, but I think, uh, you know, Todd, no matter what he, no matter, I could have at that point in time challenged any writer in the business. I say, try to write a dull looking page of Spider-Man, you know, don't even include Spider-Man. It just, Try to make it as dull as possible. I could give that page to Todd, not say a word to him. It'll come back and it'll look great. It'll look cool. Todd had, uh, you know, other artists, particularly more old school, traditional artists who, you know, maybe wanted, you know, like, you know, uh, things to be anatomically correct and all that kind of stuff. They didn't quite get Todd because you know, he was breaking a lot of rules. I think Todd, r Todd's greatest uh, insight and, and talent was he knew what 10, 11, and 12-year-olds thought was cool. You know, he could design pages and characters and ultimately toys, you know, because he, he never, you know, everyone else, myself included, you know, the older you get, you go, well, you know, there's a reason action figures don't look like the real characters because they're, they're, you know, there's limited means of production and it would cost them a fortune to do it. Whereas Todd never gave up that kid's point of view. It's like, how come this can't be cool? Or how come it can't be like this? And he would ask me all sorts of oh, questions yeah. all the time, uh, asking me like, how come those, those epic comics are printed on so much better paper and, and have better color reproduction, et cetera. And, 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 and here we are doing a top selling Marvel comic and, and it's, and it's printed on uh, toilet paper. And I said, no, it's not. I wrote the Marvel toilet paper. This is much <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and I did write the Marvel toilet paper, but <laughs> through Todd, you know, in, in many ways, it's almost like I had maybe been at Marvel a little too long and I knew all the reasons why or rationalizations, et cetera. Right. And it was great to have someone coming in from the outside asking these questions. And rather than just, uh, you know, shut up, just draw the thing stuff. <laughs> you know, I, I would like, Oh, that's, you know, I, let me see what I could find out. And at the time I remember asking uh, Carol Kalish, who was uh, Marvel's head of direct sales you know, the, you know, the distribution to the comic book shops, et cetera. Uh, and I asked her and she said, well, that's a good question. You know, the Epic books are, you know, lower circulation. They're, they're just sold to comic book stores exclusively. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas Marvel wanted to maintain, uh, this is when they still sold lots of comics on newsstands. And they wanted to keep the price point as low as possible right. to make to make the comics as uh, you know affordable to kids. That was still right. the audience they were going for, and they wanted you know kids at Seven Eleven or you know their local newsstands to you know be able to afford these comics. And unfortunately, that meant in order to keep the price as low as possible, at that point, <laughs> you know some of the worst printing you know, Marvel ever had, you know, when you look at those flexographic comics, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the cheapest paper possible, 
you know, it was, you know, it was, an, it, it, was, it, was, it was a struggle they were going through to make, you know, to maintain, you know, the, the, the circulation and to, and to keep this uh, wide audience. So I said, oh, yeah, okay, I, I totally understand. I'll be able to explain that to Todd. And I was walking away from her office and she said, smart woman, this Carol Kalish. Uh, <laughs> now, if you and Todd want to do another book, you know, direct only with Spider-Man in it, I think we could have better paper, and <laughs> mm -hmm. but it would have a higher cover price, and it probably, you know, wouldn't be on the newsstand per se. Uh, so at that particular point in time, the last thing I wanted to do, here I was wanting to just do one Spider-Man title, you know, <laughs> even if it was weekly. The last thing I wanted to do was another one. But when, you know, working with Todd, uh, initially he had a similar, you know, not as extreme as when Alfredo was inking him, but the first inker he got, you know, I think Todd had wanted Terry Austin, who wasn't available. Everyone wanted Terry back in those days, uh, but a very talented, great inker, uh, uh, Bob McLeod was inking Todd, and also sort of like Joe Rubenstein, sort of from that Neil Adams school, and these guys just couldn't help themselves. They were figuring, oh, look at this drawing. Oh, I'll have to fix it here and there, you know, <laughs> fix the anatomy, fix some of the mistakes. You know, they wanted to look as good as possible. Their heart was totally in the right place, right. but they were going against what, what Todd was uh, looking for. So, you know, Todd, you know, like uh, was like expressing his concerns to me and having earlier when I worked with John Byrne, who originally also wanted uh, Terry to ink the Fantastic Four when he did it, and the schedules didn't work out for whatever reasons. Uh, I had pushed, you know, like, why don't you just, you're writing it yourself, you're penciling it, ink it. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is not a crazy thing. You know, Steve Ditko used to pencil and ink all his stuff at Marvel in the, the 60s, et cetera. And, uh, you know, like this way you could contain as much control as possible. Oh, and so I, I did the same challenge Todd to the same thing. And he, he was like eager to do it. And even though he hadn't really uh, inked much before, he had to ask other inkers for advice, which pens to get, et cetera, et cetera. And, and as, as Todd kept getting more and more involved uh, creatively, uh, of course he reaches a point where he's thinking for better or worse, uh, you know, you know, it would probably be more fun to write my own stories. But to be 100% clear, you know, it, he was in no way advocating, you know, get rid of someone else and, and you know, get rid of David and all. Let me write. That didn't happen. No, he, he wanted to tell his own story. Todd would never do something. Well, you know, well I, I'll read these histories and uh, of what happened. And I was there, and, uh, and I read them, and, I, and like, it'll say, well, you know, Todd was in such a position that uh, Marvel offered him his own title. It's like, well, technically that could be considered true. It wasn't anyone over me. <laughs> right. It was me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and what had happened is I had remembered Carol being open to the <laughs> idea of, of this book with better paper, better printing. And I thought, well... If I can't keep Todd on Amazing, why don't? Because there was also another need that had popped up: is the Marvel had been, you know, producing, uh, uh, you know, they were getting into doing a lot more trade paperbacks, right? And the nature of Spider-Man comics, where the stories quite often didn't end neatly at one point or another. And I thought, well, maybe if I could have another Spider-Man title, going against everything I'd said before, <laughs> you know, having one, I thought maybe there's one where they could sort of take place at a specific point in the continuity, but maybe they're a six-part story, and they could easily be collected for trade paperbacks. You yep. know, so I wouldn't have to go crazy, like where do we cut and divide, and how do we do this? And uh, so it just seemed like something more to solve 
you know, the trade paperback problem, you know, to keep Todd doing Spider-Man. And, uh, you know, so when he finally got to that point, uh, he very totally honestly, you know, he said, if someone gives me backups, you know, little backup strips to do or, or features or, you know, the lowest selling title, that's what he felt he deserved as a, a beginning writer. But because of what I said about how Todd was so good at creating, you know, these visually dynamic pages, I didn't think that the, I mean, no offense to any of the writers at Marvel at the time, but I thought, you know, it seems that the visuals are so important that if I'm working with Todd and I'm helping him, you know, you know, with the writing and what have you, you know, I, I think it'll do okay. You know, <laughs> I think, I think we'll have something still. And, uh, and that's what led to it. And uh, I had a lot of fun at the time because I got the name, the new title. I had to propose it, uh, which is something I refused to do. Marvel also another transition it was going through at that time was it was bought by new, you know, a new corporation. I think it was uh -huh. a new world at the time New World, or it may have been uh, Perlman. I can't remember. I think it was Perlman actually. Hmm. And, uh, and it was becoming a little bit more corporate and like they had procedures, you know, like uh, you had to fill out a new project form that would mm. go before an editorial committee to decide, you know, and I had been spoiled. I'd been at Marvel too long at that point. And, you know, it was always, whether it was Stan Lee or Jim Shooter, I could always go up to them and say, what do you think of this idea? And if they said no, fine. I had plenty more. And if they said, yeah, that was great, then I could do it. But the Very idea fun. of me filling out an application for another Spider-Man title by one of the top selling Spider-Man artists just seemed so ludicrous. I refused <laughs> to do it. Fortunately, they okayed the idea anyway. And, uh, you know, it, it turned out uh, uh, very well, and uh, it worked out nicely for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, critically, there were some people uh, who weren't thrilled with Todd's writing, and uh, I, I could see that. But uh, but one of the things that I, I also get uh, kind of sensitive about is that some people uh, completely dismiss it as a, as a novelty. Oh, there were, you know. Uh, multiple covers and gimmicks and this, that, and the other thing. But the, but when people, you know, have gone back and looked at the sales of the three Spider-Man titles during that period, they'll see they were increasing rapidly month after month and had nothing to do with a new number one or multiple covers or anything like that. And I think one of the things that, we were, you know, involved with is promoting the hell out of this new title. Uh, one example uh, I'll give you is uh, I have to explain a little of the history to put it in context is uh, I wound up uh, getting on uh, the TV uh, uh, early morning show on CBS, uh, CBS this morning, then hosted by Paula Zahn. And, uh, <laughs> How that came about is weeks before that, you know, I was, you know, in many ways, I, I was at a point in my career at Marvel where I was doing everything I possibly could to make Spider-Man as uh, successful as possible. You know, on that phone call I was describing earlier, what I told Todd was, you stick with my plan. In seven years, we'll, make, we'll overtake the X-Men, which he thought was insane. But we wound up doing it in three years. Yeah. And uh, and we were doing, and like, you know, I, I think in many ways, Marvel was like a, this laboratory I had. And I was going to put everything I had into it to make Spider-Man as, as successful as, as popular, uh, as possible. And... One of the things, uh, Marvel had a person who was in charge of their public relations, and uh, mostly she answered to Jim Galton, and a lot of it was just uh, 
like puff pieces for, you know, you know, just, I mean, just company PR. Yeah. Uh, yeah a good great. example would be every year, Marvel would send actors in costumes uh, to, to the Easter egg hunt at the White House. So they right. would maybe get a picture of a, the Marvel characters with the president of the United States or something like that. You know, very non-controversial, you know, stuff. Uh, so when I proposed to the uh, public relations person, you know, we're coming out with a new Spider-Man title. She just was totally not interested. You know, she was not getting any pressure from above. It was just someone, you know, she didn't really have to answer to me. And I said, and her, her rationalization, not being a huge comics fan herself, was, uh, who cares if we come out with another Spider-Man comic? <laughs> That's not a news story. There's no hook or whatever. <laughs> That's comical to think about now, but yeah. Well, I, I I was determined, so I did whatever I had to, and I went around to various people in charge to to push it through. And they even said, "Well, you wanted to uh, you know, write the press release yourself," and and it, and she was forced to send it out to poor lady. And um, <laughs> and this was back in a time where newspapers were still a big deal, and. Uh, the Daily News, which was the biggest circulation paper in the country at the time, uh, Daily News alone did three stories about Spider-Man number one the week it came out. And uh, and if people who follow wow. how TV news works <laughs> for, for the longest time, it just... That had to be the easiest job to, if you were a TV news writer. You just get the newspaper and go... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It happened so many times. And uh, so what happened is the next day, uh, you know, I, it, it, was a, it was a lunch hour and uh, a phone, I get a phone call and uh, it was someone from CBS this morning and they wanted to put they already got Stan Lee, I think, to agree to be on the next day, and they wanted to talk about this new Spider-Man title. Uh, and the company policy at the time, as they were becoming more corporate, and wisely so, I totally understood the policy, was if you got any phone calls regarding public relations, you have to refer it to the public relations department. Right. And so I tried to do that, and they were insistent. They were like, "No, no, no. We we were we want to do this. We we need an answer now." Or blah 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 blah. You know, they were pressuring me. And as I said, it was lunch hour, so I figured, okay, I I, I I'm not gonna I'm not crazy. I'm not gonna agree to something I've been told I can't do. So I went to um, look for Tom DeFalco, who's the editor in chief. He was also out to lunch, but Mark Grunewald. Back to Mark again. <laughs> uh, who was the executive editor? I asked Mark, you know, like, what should I do? Told him what was happening. He he just looked at me. He said, um, "Do you want to do it?" I said, "Sure." You know, obviously, <laughs> I'm putting all this effort into uh, coming out with this new Spider-Man comic. Of course, I'll do whatever it takes to uh, to help. And he said, "Do it." Okay. Mark gave me the go ahead. Got back to them. They 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 were happy. Okay, you know I, I wasn't ever exposed to this side of the media world. You know we'll have a limo pick you up tomorrow morning, <laughs> bring you to the studio, oh. et cetera, et cetera. Um, after lunch hour was over, I guess word got to our wonderful the same person who didn't want me to do a press release because no one would do a story on. Marvel coming out with a new Spider-Man comic, came into my office, totally upset, raging mad. How dare you? You know, the policy is to, you know, refer to the, you know, refer, refer all such calls to my department. You know, how dare you, you know, agree to do, you know, like, uh, you know, like uh, agree to CBS this morning. You know, we could have got probably the Today Show or, I mean, like, you didn't even think it would be in newspapers. And so at this point, honestly, I hardly ever lose my temper. But at that point, I think I had enough. And I just said, fine, I won't do it. 
leave me alone. <laughs> Which uh, was, was pretty nasty on my part. She had to come back and, you know, beg me to uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. beg me to do it, which I did. And yet again, I've always felt I'm like one of the luckiest guys alive. But in this context, it's probably a terrible thing to say. But two things had happened. One of the things and the other, the, it's all connected in the media world. Uh, David Letterman had just switched the, his show. He, he left NBC to be on CBS. And back in the days when uh, we all, before we all had remote controls, people would have dials. And if they watched Letterman that night, the dial would be still on CBS in the morning. And uh, and there was a lot of other things involved as well. But the biggest one probably was that that same morning that I was going to be on, uh, Kuwait was invaded. So it was the big news story. Everyone was going to turn their television. There's a war. I got to see what's going on. And they turn on this show, and there's Paul is on in the studio with me, and sort of like a Star Trek bridge scene where on a big screen in front of us was Stan Lee, and we're all talking about this new Spider-Man comic. And it was just Absolutely, you know, like they, they couldn't have been nicer, more wonderful to us. I mean, they were all incredibly enthusiastic. Even when they cut to the next thing with the weather report, you know, the weather guy is a big comics fan. Wow, well, I'm going to be looking forward to that. <laughs> that Spider Man <laughs> comic. And, and that, was just, that was just one example of uh, how much media we were getting and how much fun we were having it. My favorite thing in the office before we came out with it is everyone was already predisposed to the spinoff titles, having titles like the web of Spider-Man, Peter Parker, the spectacular Spider-Man. So for a month, I just kept asking people in the office, guess what I'm going to call the new Spider-Man comic. (laughs) And not a single person would ever guess it. And, uh, they say, well, what are you going to call it? Uh, you know, uh, the, the astonishing Spider-Man, the uh, the aristocratic Spider-Man. <laughs> what are you going to call it? Uh, I said Spider-Man. And they would all say, just Spider-Man? No, no, Spider-Man. <laughs> I was almost tempted to name it just Spider-Man, but we went with Spider-Man. And, 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 and it was just a lot of fun. You know, everyone involved had a great time. It did incredibly well. Um but my point was uh, between the, uh, the fans who were already following the titles and, and it was, you know, I, I really felt it was legitimately expanding the same way uh, the X-Men audience was expanding early on. And, and kids were, you know, it was a younger audience. It wasn't, you know, the same audience that was, originally reading X-Men who was still reading Marvel. I think a lot of new kids were really excited by this. And if you go to anything, uh, any of Todd's uh, promotional appearances anywhere, you'll, oh, you'll yeah. see, you can almost go down the line of the you know, long lines of his fans who still come out to see him. They, they were excited about Spider-Man number one. And that's how they first may have become aware of uh, Todd McFarlane. And, uh, you know, so there was a, a real organic approach, uh, plus a lot of the publicity, you know, where because it was called Spider-Man, it was an opportunity for many people. Oh, oh maybe if I buy that, it'll be. So there was probably oh, sure. investors. Yeah. But I think some people like to d- dismiss it as that's all it was. And, no, no, <clears throat> it wasn't. I mean, I was running and, a shop. And well, just one last thing. I mean, one of the, I think it was the newsstand edition, for example, was, or one version of it was actually limited, which we mm-hmm. thought was amusing at the time because it was limited to only 250,000 copies, which was probably the sales of Amazing Spider Man, you know, maybe a year before. So it mm-hmm. seemed like, you know, we're, we're not going to have to enforce that, but uh, <laughs> yeah. we did. I mean, we could have literally sold millions more, oh, but, for sure. but but we, we, we kept it as it was. It was basically 
you know, two different uh, versions originally, although one was bagged and unbagged. And even that was another issue I had with Marvel, where I had something, there was something originally supposed to be in that bag, but they decided against it, so we didn't do it. Uh, if you're oh, curious well, about it. Huh? Since you asked. <laughs> Marvel was approached to do a promotional comic for uh, the band Cheap Trick. Oh. And uh, we did it. I wrote it, and it was published. June Brigman uh, drew it. But for some reason, uh, they weren't interested in having it bagged with um, Spider-Man, so we didn't do it. But somehow the bag stayed, <laughs> the comic, you know, vanished that we were, it's going to be a free extra thing, you know, like free the, extra cheap trip comic, which I, I loved it because of the, the name, you know, like a cheap yeah. trick, you know, like to, yeah. to try to sell more comics, but, uh, <laughs> uh, I love it. but, 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 you know, it was just trying to have fun and all that. But, uh, you know, so I, I, I really do think, uh, you know, it wasn't just, uh, you know, speculators and all that. There was a lot of ex genuine excitement because then Marvel later tried to replicate the same thing with the X-Men, ironically. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you could still find uh, unsold copies of X-Men number one in the uh, in your favorite comic book shop. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Spider-Man, uh, I, I, I sold that comic at, at that time when it came out. There was definitely plenty of speculators and collectors in there hoping to get rich, but that was exactly. definitely... That was definitely not all of it. There were there were legitimate fans who were excited to see this artist that they loved on a brand new book. There he was writing it. I mean, there was there was a lot of reasons as if you're a comic fan to jump in at that point. And people yeah, were, I mean, and to give Todd uh, his props here, he uh, I don't think Spawn has lasted over 300 issues. Uh, I mean, if they're still patiently waiting. <laughs> <laughs> for the prices to go up on uh you know i i, I think it's yeah. a it's a little beyond that at this point uh, that's it is you know from yeah. from amazing spider-man 300 to spawn 300 that's uh, quite an accomplishment uh, for todd that's a pretty legendary uh career you've had i mean you've 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 sat atop some of the some of the books that everybody remembers i mean the uh, the dark phoenix saga certainly the, the john byrne fantastic four run the stuff with avengers uh craven's last hunt this with todd on spider-man i mean that's that's kind of the that's that's running the that's running the game uh for well it's almost lot. what's what's fun now is uh since Marvel, uh, all the TV shows and movies, things that maybe were uh, minor uh, or, or obscure things uh, when we were working on it. Now it's like, uh, you know, uh, I, I edited the uh, Vision and Scarlet Witch, the second uh, limited series, yeah. the 12-parter yeah. where where we have the uh, nosy next door neighbor and uh, we, we have Agatha Harkness in it. And, you know, uh, Wanda gets uh, uh, pregnant and has twins. And, you know, all that was sort of like no one was even uh, noticing that right. book when we did it, although it did sell well at the time. And uh, yeah, now. It would have been nice uh, if they put that out on trade right when the uh, show was out. That would have been several. A thing. I mean, uh, you know, like yeah. it's like they they, they publishing, uh, you know, everything that, that has those characters in it, and uh, which was probably a smart move because uh, who could have ever expected? I mean, at the time that uh, the limited series I edited came out, I actually uh, was approached by a friend of mine who uh, promoted parties at clubs. You know, it was a big thing back in the day. And he said, well, maybe we could do something with, you know, some comic you're working on. So I said, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm doing a Vision in the Scarlet Witch. So we had a, I still have those invitations we sent out. It was at the <laughs> wow. Cat Club in uh, Manhattan. And uh, to see suddenly, you know, uh, the success of WandaVision, where everyone now knows who, who those characters were, it's... Uh, it's it's really incredible and a lot of fun to see and 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 just to have like a tiny part in you know minor elements of, of the show uh th that's exciting and you know the the marvel cinema cinematic universe people really have a 
uh, a wonderful job in the sense that they have 80 years, over 80 mm -hmm. years of projects, where all they have to do is, well, we'll take this little piece from here, mm -hmm. and we'll take that little piece from there, and we'll stir it up in a whole new thing, and they're doing a wonderful job, so it's great to see that. Nice. And uh, you also edited, uh, what was it, the What The comics, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, uh, I, uh, oh, yes, excuse yeah. me, I was, uh, I was going to say, I didn't do What If, I did What The, but yeah, yeah that's what exactly the. what you said. I think I was thrown, because Joe now looks like, in the early Marvel comics, whenever <laughs> they had a secret mastermind supervillain, they were all in that kind of silhouette yeah. you didn't see who they were no, he's, he's yeah. all silhouette at the moment yeah <laughs> yeah it's the lighting behind me just to keep who, who is that evil focus. villain <laughs> it's richard nixon that was uh, <laughs> was, uh <laughs> i i think it, it's something i desperately wanted to do i mean i threw in there was you know there's a lot of good stuff in there a lot of fun stuff but uh, i didn't I, I didn't uh at one point uh, when I was editing uh, the Avengers, Fantastic Four, and all that, uh, I think they needed to get a new editor for, for Crazy Magazine. And one of the many things I wanted to do was edit a humor magazine. And it really is sort of a full-time job because there's so many features and so much thought required. Uh, that I was uh, nervous about it. And I asked Shooter, who sort of offered it to me, but the, but the condition was I, my career would rise or fall depending on the success of crazy. <laughs> oh. okay. So I figured <laughs> I'll stick with the Fantastic Four, the Avengers, Cap, Iron Man, Thor, et cetera. Probably and they either. wound up uh, hiring uh, Larry Hama to do crazy. And then when eventually, you know, uh, it, it was uh, uh, canceled and the last cover actually had uh, the cover gag was by me. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the right decision, of course, was, you know, Larry was too valuable not to keep as a, as a comics editor. So, I don't, I don't begrudge anyone over that, but you know, this was like sort of an unfulfilled uh, dream of mine, you know, to edit like mad or, or something like that. And what the came up and I don't think I had the time to really devote to it because one of my favorite Marvel comics in the sixties was not brand Eck, And, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I can't, I think, unfortunately, uh, Marie Severn was too busy with the star comic she was working on. Uh, Tom Sutton, I would have loved to have, uh, I got to work with him later when I went to Topps Comics and uh, other places. Matter of fact, one of the first comics I fully uh, edited uh, at Marvel when I, when I took over from Roger Stern was an issue of Marvel premiere number 50, which featured Alice Cooper. And I got Tom Sutton to draw it. And that ever elusive inker Terry Austin wound up inking it. Uh, I think he said he felt sorry for me when I was begging him to, uh, <laughs> to, to ink it. And uh, he took pity on me, but he did a great job on it. And uh, but, so when I had this other opportunity, I think I, I was so involved still with the Spider-Man stuff that was eating up so much of my time that I, I you know, fortunately uh, it came out really well. Uh, I think Carl Potts also edited it. And I think he uh, was able to devote, or he was probably much better at scheduling his time than I am and, you know, put together some stuff with some, you know, I couldn't get Maurice Severin, but he was able to get John Severin, et cetera, et cetera. So he had some really great artists and good stuff in there. And I think we had some fun stuff as well. The, probably oh, yeah. my favorite thing was the uh, Spider-Ham story, uh, which was a spoof of uh, Raven's Last Hunt. Yeah. And that sort of came about because uh, through a scheduling conflict, uh, 
Alex uh, Savia could come in one day and, um, you know, the, the plot for, he was turning in his pages for the latest issue and the normal routine is he'd have the, uh, you know, plot ready for the, the next one. Unfortunately, you know, like I think Peter David had other projects that got in the way and he was you know, very, you know, sorry. And, but we didn't want uh, Alex to leave the, uh, the office empty handed. So it was really uh, my assistant, Glenn Herdling, and I, you know, plotted something out uh, uh, very quickly. I think we got Mike Zek <laughs> to do the silly cover, and uh, uh, it oh, worked yeah. out okay. So that was a lot of fun. That's when people remember, I think, that, that issue. And it was a time when it, it felt like, uh, uh, from the outside, it felt like the company was enjoying itself, that the people were having fun. You, you got that feeling as a customer, as a reader, that this was a company that knew how to poke fun at itself and, and was just having a lot of fun at what it was doing. I think uh, uh, the, the previous editor uh, on Spider-Man, uh, very talented, uh, great guy, uh, uh, Jim Owsley, now better known as Christopher Priest, his, his approach was uh, very different. He had his own way of doing things. I have mine. Everyone, has, you know, that's that's what defines sure. us. Uh, and even, even architecturally regarding our offices, he, his, because he was a much cooler guy than I could ever be, you know, almost looked like a, a record company executive's office. You know, he had high tech uh, furniture that his own furniture he brought in and, you know, special lighting and chairs. And it was like really super cool. Uh, my office look like uh, a comic book store in a sense in that or, or a flea market in that <laughs> I was totally throwing myself into um, Spider-Man. So wherever I went, if I saw any Spider-Man tchotchkes uh, merchandise, you know, like, you know, I think my budget was always, if it's under $5, I'm buying it. It was all sorts of stuff. And like had it all had posters, those articulated cardboard figures. It was like, it just screamed Spider-Man all over the place. And, uh, awesome. and even as a, a, cause it, cause it would work whenever, uh, people, news crews came up to do a story on Marvel, they look around and what looks visually the most like a comic book company. And they go, that guy's office, <laughs> even, uh, for one of Stan's first cameos was a, a movie called the ambulance where, uh, they originally, you know, the, the, the director wanted to uh, film in the Marvel bullpen. Marvel said, no, we can't stop production, you know, you know, for whatever day. It wasn't a weekend, so they, they couldn't do it. And but they so they looked around. They said, well, can we borrow this stuff in that guy's office? And I owned all that stuff. <laughs> so uh, I said, sure, you can if you put me in the movie. And <laughs> so if one looks closely at this uh, silly movie called The Ambulance, uh, Stan has a, 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 one of his first cameos where he actually has lines and everything. It was fun to be there while they were filming because you could see, yeah, as Stan put it, you know, Eric Roberts, who was the star of the movie, he played this uh, comic book artist who meets this woman who he... Uh, had been drawing a lot and fell in love with, and now he, you know he wants to find her, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, when he was had a scene with Stan, uh, he was so good that Stan would forget he's supposed to be acting and, and think that Eric was just talking to him, and he respond and. The, Cut, Stan, your lines. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> and. Uh, I think uh, in, 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 uh, in so what they had, uh, they took a room out in the Puck building in New York and they put all my stuff all over. They decorated. I had enough in my one cubicle of an office to decorate an entire Marvel bullpen in a movie. <laughs> and uh, the other artists they, they had, I think, uh, among others, uh, the artwork they used in the movie was by Gene Collins. So Gene had, was in it. Stan was in it, Larry Hama, I think Joe Jesko, uh, maybe a couple of other guys. It was funny when the day we were shooting, we had a re report to wardrobe and the actual <laughs> comic book artist 
were were given different clothes to wear because they didn't look like comic book artists uh, per the. But whatever I was wearing, yeah, you look like a comic book artist. So I got to play one on the. Uh, so if you, I think uh, they cut out most of the the comic storyline for that movie in the final thing. So I think I'm on the screen for all of uh, two seconds. But Stan's cameo is still in there. Very nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, I'll I'll have the movie poster up there. People can kind of remember that. That's a that's a cool memory. You you um, ultimately you'd, you'd leave Marvel. You'd go to Tops uh, and do comics there. What was? Why did you? Uh, what what caused you to leave Marvel? Or what what was your what was your moving away reason? It was changing. I mean, it was becoming more corporate. I you know, and uh, uh, I didn't really have any problems with that. I didn't either. Ha- I also didn't have a desire to be the editor in chief of Marvel. I, I, I was uh, uh, you know wanting to try to do other things. As I said, one of my first comics at Marvel was. Uh, uh, Alice Cooper. I you know, tried to work on the Muppets with Roger, and uh, you know, I was always looking for ways to expand the comics audience overall and get involved in all sorts of other things. There was one time someone who had seen my Spider-Man office, the way I was describing it to you, and they were very sincere, and they said, "Gee, I'll, I imagine you'll be really sad when you're no longer uh, editing Spider-Man." And I said, no, not at all. I mean, I love, love editing Spider-Man, but whatever I'm editing, you know, I'm always 100% into it. I mean, uh, even when I was editing Spider-Man, I would tell people, I didn't really even think of myself as Spider-Man's editor. I really almost thought of myself as Spider-Man's manager. And... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, handling his career. And we were even thinking of things like, uh, you know, the future in terms of movies and what have you. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. There was one point where there was this absolutely, her- this was when New World owned Marvel. And I'll get back to Tops in a second. Uh, where they wanted to do a Spider-Man. They had a script for a Spider-Man movie. And what it was, the, the you know, the, 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 the script writers obviously thought, well, that Fly movie with Jeff Goldblum seemed to do really well. Why don't we make a movie like that? If some teenager turns into a disgusting monster fly or something. And, you know, whether it was a good movie or not, not for me to say, but for, but for some reason, you know, I, I, by being the Spider-Man editor at that point, they were kind enough, you know, like the... I think three people at Marvel were, you know, sort of given the scripts to look at. It was Stanley, Tom DeFalco, and myself. And I think uh, Tom and I were just dead set, dead set against it. You know, this is terrible. You know, it's not Spider-Man. Surprisingly, Stan, mm-hmm. who, you know, I think it's fair. You know, he, he would he would have called himself a company man anyway. He didn't want to say no to something that might bring the company some money or, or what have you. So he, he was really wishy-washy about it, (laughs) but you know, we were like, no, no, Spider-Man has to be Spider-Man. That's, that was my whole thing. And that applied to everything else I would ever work on. So as I said earlier, in even though working at Marvel was my dream when I was 15 years old, you know, eventually, you know, like you could get only so much out of, you know, whatever. And I, you know, it was tempting to think about, well, you know, I could be like Julie Schwartz or something and just be the Spider-Man editor for the rest of my life. And I don't think I would have minded it that much, but I think everything else was changing. I thought, yeah, you know, I've been here so long and, the competitive side of me had so much fun, you know, trying to, uh, you know, defeat <laughs> the X-Men in sales in a sense that, and, and had, you know, it was so lucky to have, you know, you know, success doing it, that the time was coming where it seemed like, uh, I'm not sure if I want to stick around here much anymore. It's not really the same place that it was 20 years ago. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, you know, I had lots of people there who I loved and enjoyed working with. You know, if ever I was going to have an opportunity, you know, the success I had with the Spider-Man uh, material made it. You know, suddenly there were there were some offers, and uh, specifically. I was called in, you know, like, do you want to be the editor in chief at, you know, Topps Comics? Another offer, surprisingly, was uh, to be the editor in chief at uh, Penthouse Comics. And uh, very different jobs. Yeah. Yes. Well, there, there were all sorts of other reasons why I, I couldn't do it uh, uh, <laughs> or didn't or chose not to do it. Partly, one of the biggest ones, honestly, was uh, I had this wonderful meeting with uh, Bob Guccione, who was the uh, the owner of, of Penthouse. Now, even when I was at Marvel, you know, with Stan and everyone else, uh, for the most part, it was like, it was very accessible. You know, you could talk to Stan you know, or Jim Shooter or Tom DeFalco and, you know, can I do this? Can I not do this? And it was, it was, it was easy, easy, easy. Uh, and I got to do a lot of things I wanted, lots of projects, uh, that I really enjoyed doing, you know, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, but when I met with the, uh, you know, Guccione, it was clear that this was his empire. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I thought, you know, I, I, I I've, I've answered, if I'm going to answer to anyone, I, I could just stay at Marvel and, you know, there's, I can answer to Ron Perlman ultimately, you know, whatever. You know, I don't need to go somewhere else, uh, uh, although it was tempting. And uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, suggest to a writer, George Carrigan, who was uh, doing work for me at the time, that, hey, here's an opportunity. I knew he was unhappy not getting uh, the assignments he wanted at Marvel. He was a little naive that way in that, uh, you know, he just thought he could walk in and, ah, here, here, George, you may write the X-Men now. And (laughs) that's not how it worked. And I think he was very impatient and he was, I was happy to give him work. I was handling handling, uh, a lot of uh, what they called custom comics towards the end of my stay at at Marvel. And uh, he, he was great at them. He knew the characters. He, he would good be good in the meetings we would go into, et cetera, et cetera. I used to write a bunch of those myself over the years, everything from Kool-Aid Man to the uh, Spider-Man child abuse prevention comic, you know, the Nestle yeah. Quick Bunny, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so he, he was good at that. I thought, oh, well, you know, here's an opportunity. Uh, you want to, you know, do this. And he did. And, uh, and this was an example of um, not to speak ill of George, because unfortunately, whatever circumstances happened to him, he wound up committing suicide, uh, yeah. you know, in a spectacular fashion, um, which was very, very unfortunate. But I think it was his his personality was really so different from mine that. When I you know, like uh, when the first issues came out of Penthouse Comics, uh, they look like you know, like oh, let's do Marvel comics with sex. <laughs> yeah. You know, like in my wildest you know imaginings as an editor, you know, if I was assigned you know, let's do Penthouse comics, I would want to do an erotic adult comics magazine. You know, like a lot of European stuff, sure. et cetera, et cetera. Sure. And uh, and maybe it would have been fun to have one story where you're having fun with superheroes having sex, but the whole magazine to just be that, that didn't really scream penthouse to me. So, yeah, no, that yeah, was that, unfortunate. That was kind of a miss, I think. Uh, yeah, but I yeah. did go with Tops, and they were wonderful. Uh, I, uh, you know, around the same time I left, I helped put together. Uh, a meeting with uh, Terry Stewart, with um, the guys who were planning to leave to start uh, Image, because uh, I got along very well with them, and uh, and this is what I mean. I mean, Marvel was sort of acting in a very bizarre way. They were you know, like they were, even though it was very clear that Spider-Man number one, X-Men number one, and a lot of other titles 
were doing incredibly well, not just because they were Marvel characters, that certainly was a big factor, but because of the talent doing it. Right. And the talent was getting their their royalties, et cetera. But Marvel was taking this sort of hard stance and it was my best interest to go along with it. But I just thought it was so absurd. I, I couldn't, I couldn't. It was almost like they were saying the editors are like the most important part of <laughs> putting these comics together. And I, believe me, I think editors are very important and can make a big difference. But it's a, it really is a team effort. And, and, and like, yes, it's really important what properties you're working on, you know, what the talent is. It's, there's so many factors involved. But this whole clash of, no, it's the artists are the most important. No, the editors, the company That's characters. Really yeah. It was just yeah. insane. And I was happy not to have any part of it. The, 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 the footnote that I enjoy pointing out that most people are unaware of is that, uh, you know, there, there, there was a, when <laughs> I could present it to you as just, this is how other people like to distort and spin things, but if, I'm doing it in my favor. When I left Marvel, the, uh, it was announced in the Wall Street Journal, uh, and it, the, the stock price uh, fell uh, two points, and it didn't recover for several years. So I personally caused, caused uh, Ron Perlman uh, to lose millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but what I conveniently left out of that story is the article in the Wall Street Journal was about me and the image guys <laughs> leaving Marvel at the same time. And, but, but it was a story. I mean, like they did uh, pick up on it because uh, uh, Tops is a publicly traded company and Marvel at that point was also publicly traded. And uh, it wasn't something that, you know, didn't get uh, Ron Perlman's attention. You know, even his, um, Earlier on, uh, when I was editing Marvel Age, one of his daughters was even Faith Perlman was one of my uh, my interns, so which was fun. But uh, Perlman like was sort of in shock, especially seeing the stock price fall. And so, like in and in the in in the article, they you know referred to me as, you know, the editor of the recent, you know, best-selling Spider-Man and, and in Perlman, a businessman, you know, he's like, how, how could he have left? How could you let someone like that slip through your fingers? You know, mm -hmm. uh, didn't he have a, didn't he have a contract? Can we, you know, you know, get him back or something? And like, that was, you know, like, you know, you know Perlman has this, like, everyone likes to blame everything that went wrong at Marvel on him. But I, I, I don't think that's entirely fair. Well, uh, like but, you're in the comics, it's a team effort, I think. But one of the things that was so crazy, and I still haven't got a thank you from any of my fellow editors back then, <laughs> is as a result of that, all the editors got contracts. Uh, and keep in mind, this was at the height of the, um, the boom. So it wasn't that long that it all, you know, the bust began. And I couldn't believe it at the time. But again, this is another thing, thanks to, I, I believe, uh, the incredibly kind Mark Grunewald, mm -hmm. where when they had to uh, suddenly, you know, get rid of so many people at Marvel, that even though all these editors had, like, maybe another year left on their contracts, that they would be, that would be honored. They would get paid. You know, they were all let go. Not all, you know, a lot of them were let go and they were still being paid thanks to those contracts. Yeah. Uh, whereas the, the mercenary in me, if I was at Marvel, so it's a good thing I left, <laughs> right. you know, I would have said, you know, give that guy a broom. He could sweep the, yeah. the offices <laughs> and, and he could, you know, yeah, you know, I'd find stuff for them to do. I mean, if, if it's, you know, how, if you have, you know, if it's a sinking ship and you have people that are, are still uh, bound to working for you, 
Yeah. You know, I, I would have done everything I could to get Marvel back on its feet and get those guys, mm -hmm. you know, contributing in, in, in any get way them, that would have helped. Get them taking them. pages over the Comics Code Authority. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think they, had, no. I don't know when they decided to get rid of the code, but that's another story. But uh, <laughs> uh, ultimately, obviously, I, I went with Tops. Um, I, I enjoyed that uh, tremendously. The, uh, they were still in Brooklyn when I started there. And uh, so I had like a reverse commute. I was living in Manhattan and, you know, taking the train out to uh, Industry City where they had these, you know, big sort of warehouse uh, uh, offices where, you know, Tops used to make the gum back in the day. They, they Tops used to do, still mm -hmm. does, bazooka bubble gum, you know, baseball cards, et cetera, et cetera. Ira Friedman, who was their vice president in charge of uh, new product development, had sort of wisely noticed that a lot of times they were doing these uh, non-sports cards where they get a popular license and uh, a comics publisher would get the comics license and, uh, you know, Tops would do the trading cards, the comics publisher would do the comics. Now, there's a bunch of people... Uh, who worked at Tops, who were big comics fans, notably their creative director, Len Brown, who, for crying out loud, uh, Wally Wood named Dynamo after, you know, <laughs> back in the day. Uh, so he was still there. He was a super, you know, comics fan. So they, you know, I, I think they were thinking, you know, how could we expand, do more things? They had, they were sitting on a lot of money at the time. And, uh, and, and, and I think they even hired Mike Friedrich as a consultant. And of course he suggested you guys should publish comics. And uh, so they were searching for uh, an editor in chief. Uh, I believe Roy Thomas, the guy who way back when hired me at Marvel, I think, uh, you know, said, Hey, uh, that guy who edited that best-selling Spider-Man comic, I think is, a, and it might be available. Uh, talk to him. And uh, it worked out incredibly well. And uh, uh, again, I locked into something. Um, yeah. They had already decided to do an adaptation of uh, Francis Ford Coppola's uh, yep. Dracula. version of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yeah. And uh, it was thanks. You know, I like giving credit where credit's due. Uh, Len Brown had loved Mignola's work on uh, – Gotham by Gaslight. So it was the lens, the lens idea to get Mike involved. And uh, Roy Thomas was, you know, like uh, Len and Roy were even roommates back in the 60s. So, of, of, you know, Roy was already there. So it was like all I had to do was come in. And uh, I think uh, Mignola himself uh, chose Mark Chiarello, who did uh, an outstanding job on the color. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I can't remember the inker's name right at the moment, but uh, at one point uh, it was similar to the problem uh, Todd was having where uh, uh, Mike was uh, putting in like the feathering in this sort of zigzag stylistic way. And the anchor was doing, turning it into the, he thought it was just an indication for the traditional kind of feathering you see in comics. Mm -hmm. But Mike was able to talk to the anchor and say, no, 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 <laughs> let me show you what I'm looking for. And the anchor was more than happy to do it. And it was just a uh, beautiful job. I think in many ways uh, uh, the comic may work better than the movie, uh, particularly the acting. of. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. I mean, it was such a memorable book and it sold very, very well. Um, I mean, a lot of people will cite it today as one of those comics that, that they was a first comic for them. I, I just, it's, it's a, it's remarkable how many people remember that book and it looked beautiful. It was just, a well, there was some, I mean, what, what a book to start on. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. uh, I got to deal with Francis Ford Coppola for crying out loud. There was yeah. a point where, I mean, before I guess we got involved, I mean, uh, Francis, you know, obviously respects and loves comics and particularly, I think one of his sons, I think Roman, uh, also a big comics fan, um, who worked on, I think he was second director on the movie. I may be wrong on 
but uh, they'd already hired uh, Steranko, <laughs> mm -hmm. and he did all these futuristic, uh, uh, you know, concept designs and paintings for them, which are beautiful unto themselves. But clearly, that was Steranko's version of Dracula, and I don't think any of it made it into the movie, except he got a very in impressive credit at the end. So yeah. while Francis was, we, we had signed on to do it and we were working on it. We, we were working very closely. I think the, the script writer was Jim Hart. He was very easy to work with. Uh, although Roy Thomas uh, will publicly say he prefers adapting things where the original creators are no longer alive. And, uh, <laughs> I don't think Robert E. Howard ever gave Roy any hassles on <laughs> going Conan. But uh, so with, uh, with this, uh, we were, you know, uh, you know, somehow I guess uh, Francis got to see our comic and he really liked it. And, uh, so he figured he was having some problems. And first it was just a minor thing. Uh, and and they, they thought, wow, this guy's great. You know, like, and they thought maybe we could ask him to do some designs for the uh, Dracula's castle, which is a weird thing. You know, like we're adapting the movie, but now they're coming to us to ask what the movie should be like. And so <laughs> yeah. what the heck, you know, uh, Mike, Mike did it. I think they used it. And, um, uh, and I guess uh, Francis liked it so much. Uh, uh, he asked, uh, "Would would Mike consider coming in? You know, to uh, look. You know, to, Francis was you know pretty familiar situation with Francis. He was struggling with the ending again on a movie, and uh, so so he figured, you know, maybe hey, Mike, why don't you you know come in? We're having a screening. I'll show you the rough cut. Maybe we could talk about." And, uh, you know, Mike is, uh, you know, certainly aware of film. And this is, like, uh, amazing. You know, like, one yeah. of the greatest directors uh, you know, ever, you know, like, is asking, you know, why don't you come in? And Mike's imagining it's going to be, you know, screening with maybe 20 other people. And they'll have maybe a discussion with everyone. No. I had told Mike... Uh, because he was like, he didn't know how to, he was so taken aback by it. But I, I don't think Mike really needed my advice much, but because uh, he, he's a rather opinionated fellow all by himself. <laughs> but I, I just said, don't hold back. You know, they're asking for your input. Go Give for it. Up. You know, yeah. cut to, this was a film, next scene. <laughs> there were only three people in the meeting after watching the rough cut. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola, Mike Mignola, and George Lucas. Wow. Suddenly, Mike, maybe, perhaps, maybe, can't, you know, but just being himself, uh, is having a heated debate over how something should be handled with George Lucas, <laughs> while the godfather, <laughs> Francis, is just sitting back listening to them <laughs> so amazing. he can decide how he wants to continue. So, I mean... He was such a pleasure, uh, both of them, uh, to work on this title that when we proposed uh, that Francis come to the San Diego Comic Con as a guest, you know, he he, he agreed and you know, came to our booth. <laughs> this was that's awesome, unheard of, you know. So, in many ways, I, I, I feel when I hear people uh, talking about oh, San Diego, it's Comic Con, not what it used to be. It's it's all Hollywood now, and, and no more comics. And I, I have to go. <laughs> Oops! <laughs> it was you. <laughs> oh, jeez! But sorry, but yeah. that's you, an uh, awesome opportunity. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And then you also did comics like uh, Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. That was yeah. fun. I mean, uh, yeah. I wish we could have done the original, but uh, yeah. at that point. Uh, you know, there was, uh, I think, a cartoon show based yeah. on it. And, uh, and you know, it, I, I think it was fine. And But, uh, uh, again, Roy got to uh, work on it. And I don't think we ever got any problems from anyone on that. But uh, one of the things that also happened is Topps hit 
at that unfortunate point where all sorts of, I mean, I, I, I tell you guys, I'm with Marvel for 20 years. Nothing but success following success. Everything's going great. <laughs> I leave them. Everything's okay. Next thing I know, they're doing all sorts of crazy stuff, you know, and, and they're, they're basically destroying the whole comics market <laughs> with the distribution problems. And, you know, like they, you know, it's just, world. Great it was nightmarish, you know. So at the time I, uh, I had just, you know, got married. I had a family. Uh, so I was with this, I thought, solid company, tops, all American, you know, can't do better than that. And when we started, fortunately, we benefited in our early years. It was still those boom years. But as things went on, you know, suddenly there was this big crash. And I remember this is, a, this is something you never want to have to do. Uh, and, and, you know, and like, you know, I, I was probably so full of myself after the success of uh, Spider-Man and the early years of Tops, everything doing great, that uh, then suddenly everything's crumbling around us. And there was this uh, magazine I was going to mention, um, called, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was devoted to comic shop news. That was the name of it. Uh -huh. And uh, if it wasn't, no, I think it was another. It was a magazine. And one of the features it had, which I enjoyed reading, because it was very helpful. They'd ask all the different, each issue, they'd ask maybe 20 different comic store owners, you know, what's hot, what's not, you know, which books are selling, what's not selling, you know, what's a little title that no one else knows about that seems to be doing well. You know, it was really informative and I enjoyed reading those, those columns. At that period, it was not a very pleasant time to be reading those columns because one of the dealers, I can't remember who it was, uh, fortunately, but one of them said, and this quote sticks with me to this day, Topps Comics is dead in the water. Ah. <laughs> oh no! So once again, it was like, "Oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do?" And uh, fortunately, there was a couple of people who uh, uh, had some very good suggestions. Uh, uh, one was back when I lived in the Bronx. Across the street from me was this uh, fella named Stefan Petruca, and we were both uh, big comic book fans. And uh, even as kids, we would do make our own little comics together. He would be the writer. I would be the artist, et cetera, et cetera. And he has since gone on to do all sorts of great writing and novels and all sorts of stuff for Marvel. I mean, uh, it was great. So when I was at Tops, there was a couple of odd things we were doing. One was uh, a comic that was originally published by Dark Horse. Uh, I can remember the title of it. And it was turned into a, an animated series that ran on uh, USA, which was the worst channel it could have been on because that wasn't the audience for it. Was it, it was, Duckman? Uh, that's exactly right. Why can't I remember that? Okay. So simple. <laughs> it, it, I love that show. It yeah. Was a great good. show. And we came out with a couple of comics uh, based on it. And um, I think uh, Stefan uh, was writing one. Uh, you know, I had, I had like all you know, Scott Shaw did some work. Craig Yo, I think, did uh, some comics work on it. Uh, there was a lot of good people involved, but you know, the 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 the, the show wasn't a, a big hit, so it, it didn't really find its uh, audience, unfortunately. And as Stefan was working on it, uh, he said to me, like, "Hey, if you're gonna do uh, TV stuff." Uh, there's a new show that just came on that I'm really liking. And in Stefan's case, it's, it's like he, uh, his own personal interest, he loved, you know, paranormal stuff. He loved UFOs and any, all, all, anything weird. And, and, and so this was a natural show that he'd be interested in. It was the X-Files. My wife at the time also, you know, watched an early episode and said, Oh, this is really cool. And, and she also loved all that stuff. So, you know, I, I, I'm 
you know, like I'm supposedly dead in the water. I'm thinking, what the hell? Uh, you know, like uh, this might be something uh, we could get in on. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, uh, Ira Friedman was our publisher and he had connections and we were able to call Fox. And even though uh, Fox had a relationship with Dark Horse, where all Dark Horse had to do was call up, hey, we want to do that. And they'd say, sure. But, uh, you know, we, you know, Ira was able to do what he originally wanted to do. It's the original concept for uh, uh, Topps Comics, where he would get the, the trading card license and the comic book license. And, and we we do it all together. And uh, we were able to, you know, put together a team, which I was very happy with. Um, I, I think what I was trying to do uh, was kind of emulate uh, a more sophisticated look for the, this particular comic book, you know, specifically trying to look maybe like Sandman or Vertigo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was introduced to a, a young artist at an art gallery. Um, she was there. What, she, I don't think she was exhibiting there, but some of her friends were there. My, my wife at the time, Paulette Powell, you know, it was friends of friends of hers. And uh, I remember she like showing me her stuff on the, uh, in our portfolio on the floor of this art gallery, just opening it. And I think she had done some stuff for Marvel at that point, um, uh, probably for their uh, Hellraiser series or something mm -hmm. like that. And her name was Moran Kim. And she became my uh, cover artist uh, on the X-Files. Mm -hmm. Normally, one of my other crazy policies was, uh, uh, and I'll explain it, uh, when I was a comics fan in the 60s, you know, there were certain artists I just loved. And, for example, Neil Adams. And there mm -hmm. was a period at DC Comics where they had Neil Adams doing lots of their covers. So I'd buy these comic books and I was in love with the covers and I'd open up the stories. And the only thing I could say is it wasn't Neil Adams. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them were the Batman, Green Lantern, you know, yeah. Dead Man, all that yeah. stuff he did was great. That was wonderful. But on the covers were, you know, no offense to Bob Brown or Dick Dillon. They just weren't Neil Adams. And, and I was very disappointed. So you know, like Bruce Wayne, I vowed, you know, if I ever, you know, get to be editor of comics, you know, I'll have the, whoever does the inside, that's the artist is going to be on Good the thing. cover. But, <laughs> and for the most part, I still stick with that, but there, there were some notable exceptions. Uh, this one being one of them, because I guess I wanted, uh, you know, X-Files to look as if it could be part of the Vertigo line. You know, I had a yeah. lot of respect for what, what they were doing over there. And and I think it had, you know, that's the audience. Uh, I mean, Sandman had already been very successful at attracting a lot of uh, female readers. And, you know, this is something I was also interested in as well. And uh, and for the interiors, we, we, you know, we had Steph on his writing. Uh, you know, what was great about that, because you could assign, you know, every writer, and Joe will back this up, yes. will more or less agree that they could write any title in the world. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> Joe, can you write this, that, or the other thing? Just yes, tell I me what can. to do. <laughs> and, uh, and a, but instead of having a guy who had to go to the library or, you know, do research to find out about all this stuff, by choosing Stefan, I had someone who already lived and breathed that kind of material. Uh, for the interiors, we had an artist who worked out really well for us earlier on Mars Attacks. And uh, it was Charlie Adlard, who later went on to do uh, The Walking Dead <laughs> uh, comics. And even though he had difficulties, uh, he would admit, oh, I'm not good at the caricatures, uh, you know, the likenesses of the, of the guys. I felt people know who the characters are. It's not going to be a big issue. But uh, it worked out. And suddenly we went from uh, uh, dead in the water and when the first issue hit again, I mean, uh, I was doing the same type of everything I tried to do with Spider-Man. I was doing with X-Files. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, back to the daily news, for example, they had a TV 
columnist, a very talented guy. Uh, uh, I think it's David Bing Cooley. And he was their TV guy. And I noticed he would write a lot about how successful, uh, how much he liked the X-Files. So I, I didn't know. I tried calling him. I just called up the Daily News. Can I talk to this guy? <laughs> Master of PR that I am. And uh, he happened to be in. I spoke to him. And he said, sure, send it to me. He gave me an address. And, uh, he read him. I didn't hear anything back. So I thought, eh, I tried. Then I pick up the newspaper. It is uh, one day, and there's a full page. <laughs> Our cover is almost printed actual size. Oh, wow. He recaps in the first few sentences, he's recapping the story from our first issue. And he says, sounds like the next episode of X-Files. No, it's the new X-Files comic. Nice. And so he, yeah. people who liked X-Files were suddenly aware, oh, there's another X-Files thing. And uh, they would go into the comic book stores looking for it. Uh, and, and, and the same thing that happened before. First, it's in a newspaper. Then, <laughs> you know, I guess the news writers, uh, you know, X-Files was on Fox, which is Channel 5 in New York. And, you know, for the local news, you know, they're 10 o'clock, you know, uh, you know where your children are. Um, <laughs> newscast, uh, they, they, they had to see it, you know, and then they figured out, you know, and then it turned out all the Fox affiliates, because affiliates, they saw this as something uh, – it was a weird thing because the it actually the news came on after the X Files, mm -hmm. so they were actually using this news story as one of those teasers because they were getting ratings for X Files and they mm -hmm. wanted to keep them to watch the news, so they ran commercials during the X Files saying, "Yeah, that makes sense." You know, X Files is now a comic. You know, details at ten, and it was one of those things where they didn't interview us or anything they just used it as a teaser throughout the hour-long news till the very last story oh yes and tops is doing an x-files comics but you can still find the real thing each week here <laughs> on channel five <laughs> yeah. but it, it was uh so that book sort of uh, was responsible for bringing us back to life after we were dead in the water and uh, we were suddenly churning out as, as much X-Files material as we possibly could. I had uh, done another thing, which, uh, you know, uh, had been another sort of dream of mine uh, in terms of promotion. One of the biggest circulation uh, magazines at the time uh, was TV Guide, uh, mm -hmm. back before streaming and cable and all that <laughs> stuff you know people would buy their tv guide to figure out <laughs> what to watch on tv and uh, there was a, a back issue of tv guide i had from years and years from the 50s and it had a three-page feature by harvey kurtzman you know backstage at the perry como show and uh, i thought oh you know you could do comics and tv guide mm. and uh, so i so it was one of these things where somehow we got in touch with TV Guide and I got to speak to the editors there. And because at that point, uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch, who owned Fox and indirectly and the X-Files, also owned TV Guide. And so there was a little, you know, the editors admitted, you know, there was some pressure on them to run stories on the X-Files. And they were all, you know, they were looking for angles, you know, they, you know, they can't just keep doing a puff piece all the time. Uh, so this was a, oh, okay. We could do an exclusive little X-Files comic for TV Guide. And then I personally, like, it wasn't TV Guide. I, I figured, oh, well, there's this company at the time that was advertising in all the Marvel comics and elsewhere called American Entertainment. And I told them what we were planning to do. They were a mail order co uh, company that sold tons of comics. And I said, we'll work out a deal with you. I bet if you call them up, call up TV Guide, I bet you could get an ad near where this uh, X-Files comic is going to be running and say, 
you could offer these limited editions of one, two, and three that we'll happily produce for you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, after some negotiating, everyone agreed to everything. And so suddenly people who probably would have never gone to a comic book store, you know, were became aware that, Hey, I like X-Files, you know, here's the comic, here's a little sample of it. I liked it. Where can I get more? And they could either go to their comic book store or order directly from that ad. Uh, that guy who, uh, who was in charge of that company was so, I mean, that could have been a disaster because it was like, I think that ad cost him a hundred thousand dollars and uh, it, it could have been, uh, could have been awful. No one could have ordered and he would have probably hated me forever. It did <laughs> so well <laughs> that he advertised again and again. And he learned, he never had experience dealing with a national magazine and he, he didn't realize you could actually negotiate and get the price down a bit. And, you know, and we later on at tops, we did, we did a Xena comic and TV guide, et cetera. And so it was, it was a lot of fun, you know, finding more ways to try to get people aware of what we were doing. I feel like, uh, well, probably should wrap up. I've kept you for three hours almost. Uh, it's, oh, this is one of my shorter interviews then. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I just, uh, I feel you like. You could have been watching even... uh, three fourths of the new Justice League cut. <laughs> That's true. This is <laughs> That's four hours. This is the Snyder cut. I, I just, I feel like. This is the salad you know, cut. <laughs> there I, I we feel go. Like we could go like three hours more easy. You've got so many stories to tell about this business. It's, it's incredible. Gee, shouldn't I maybe consider writing a book or something? You should consider it. Right. Have you thought about something like that? Are you going to write a book? I sure hope so. Yeah. Okay. That's where, what are you, be a while. what are you doing today? What's where, where can people find you? Uh, <laughs> I'm on Facebook. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, Jim Salakrup. Uh, occasionally I'm on, on Twitter. Uh, yeah. but papercuts.com. Uh, you can see the, uh, the titles we're doing uh, just to, you know, and talk about that a little bit because we <laughs> barely got past tops yeah, was, uh, was uh, I, I was very lucky in that uh, one of, I, I think one of the most uh, unheralded uh, pioneers in the comics field, particularly graphic novels and getting material into um, bookstores and libraries is uh, my business partner, Terry Nantier. He started NBM many, many years ago, uh, over 40 years ago. And uh, by he was publishing adult graphic novels from Europe. Uh, he was one of the first guys to uh, collect classic comic strips like Terry and the Pirates, uh, mm -hmm. uh, wash tubs, uh, etc., cetera, uh, and, and do original material. And uh, his company was called NBM. And uh, at some point, you know, after so many years of, uh, you know, just, you know, there's this, this real struggle. But he, he was very successful, very tenacious. And he was like there in, in, the, in the early days getting, pushing to get comics and graphic novels uh, into bookstores. And at some point, he had he, he sort of noticed the the success manga was having, mm -hmm. which uh, manga had tried to launch in comic book form, and you know published by lots of different publishers and sold in comic book stores, but the comic book stores sort of cater to a certain audience, mm -hmm. and it's hard for them to find other people to get other people into their stores, whereas bookstores in general do get, you know, people who like to read, go to bookstores or libraries, and suddenly there were these, you know, oh, what's this, you know, and uh, and uh, manga was, uh, you know, caught on. It was a combination also of um, uh, a lot of anime was appearing on uh, certain, you know, cable stations and what have you, so there was a lot of excitement building for that. Uh, Terry's crazy notion, which uh, I'm very happy he had, was uh, and also more of an observation that the the comics market had sort of drifted away from comics for kids. Oh. The uh, the audience for uh, 
the comic book shops are like people your age, uh, you know, mm -hmm. maybe older teens on up, you know, uh, there's, it, 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 oh, and certainly not girls. And, uh, right. you know, it, it was, uh, you know, even Marvel would try to publish Barbie and even, uh, you know, it was just sort of like, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't the right context, you know. Yeah. Marvel wasn't right. reaching people. Their books were reaching where young girls were likely to um, pick it up. And I, I, with, I, uh, with new comics for a new market, but selling them in the same place. Yeah, I mean, so many uh, of the typical comic book stores were such, you know, uh, the idea of a little girl and her mom walking by, you know, uh, the Android's dungeon or what have you, yeah. and saying, "Mommy, let's go inside and see if they have anything that I might be interested in." It, <laughs> it's, you know, doesn't happen much, or even if it does, you know, like the, you know, it's gotten better over the years. Sure. So, it was a crazy idea when we started, where you know, why don't we try to do graphic novels and that appeal to you know the young kids, you know. Uh, uh okay. and and you know try to you know go after that audience uh you know it's almost like terry's was way ahead of the comics market in reaching older people that was someone something old timers like me at marvel oh we could just get more respect from older fans so eventually the the mainstream comics succeeded but almost at the cost of losing their younger audience yeah and terry who who for years had that older audience, you know, suddenly was saying, no one's paying attention to that young market anymore. <laughs> you know, maybe we could have a shot at it. Yeah. And uh, we were very lucky again, right off the bat. We had a lot of success with uh, Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys and uh, albeit in a weird manga style, but it worked out great. Uh, and then we've gone on to do, do all sorts of things. Yeah. But I think Terry deserves a lot of the credit. Uh, the other thing that's notable is, uh, again, because we had so much success and, you know, there were other other things, you know, to be fair, you know, like uh, Archie always, you know, was doing, you know, Archie Comics, uh, uh, Jeff Smith, uh, those, uh, and Scholastic, which had yep. incredible distribution with book fairs and through schools, you know, with Jeff Smith's uh, own uh, mm -hmm. comics. So, you know, there was something percolating there, but it's a whole different landscape now. Oh, What's yeah. happened, and, you know, it's backed up by the, the figures in uh, ICV2. It's like, for, you know, I remember when he first, when Kids Comics, uh, maybe 10 years ago, broke out as a category they were tracking. It was like 10% of the market is Kids Comics now. Because they're looking at the overall market. I think in the past year, for the first time, the kids' comics have finally outsold yeah. everything else, the Batman and all that stuff, you know, because of huge, you know, bestsellers like uh, Raina Tegelmeyer's books, uh, the Dogman books, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. for a little company like Paper Cuts, we're very happy about this new success. But when we first started, as I said, I could probably mention all our competitors on one hand. Now, every comics publisher, every book publisher, either they have their own kids' comics imprint or it's become a new focus of where they're putting their energy. So we have far more competition than we ever had before. And uh, as I said before, you know, I'm a competitive guy, so it Excellent. It doesn't thrill started. me, but uh, I, yeah. I'm up for it, and and uh, the challenges that uh, that it entails. I mean, the the latest thing that I'm really excited about is that we're publishing Asterix in America, mm -hmm. yeah. and that that was like one of the oh, that's you know be. prize properties that uh, you know if if uh, if you recognize uh, if you're from if you were from Europe, I mean that would be like that's the, their equivalent of uh, Batman or Spider-Man. You know, it's like, yeah. it's huge. You know, when, uh, when the last uh, volume of Asterix came out, uh, 
last year, uh, number 38, uh, it's, it's sold uh, 5 million copies. So, and they're used to that kind of sales for it. Yeah. So one of the things, uh, so, so my challenge is how do we make, you know, we, it hasn't been here all along. So it's, it's a whole new thing. And I've talked to a lot of people like yourselves who are, you know, some are more sophisticated and they've read Asterix uh, all along, probably like Joe. I don't know you that well. I've definitely read a lot of Asterix, yes. <laughs> well, then you two are above average in that sense. But a lot of American comics fans, even professionals, artists and writers who I would have had, you know, uh, expected to, you know, like they would be aware of Asterix. Right. They would know it has a great reputation, but it, but they would tell me when they would try to read it themselves, they were kind of confused and and didn't quite understand it. And a lot of it was, I think, because in Europe, you know, kids there to this day, you know, part of their school system is they they get a class and and you know they take Latin, so yeah. those Latin phrases are nothing to them. They they know what they mean. So uh, what do we do? We add footnotes and explain what they mean. <laughs> it's and, uh, but we tried to that's... Americanize it a little bit and, uh, and and make it more accessible. I mean, this is nothing. It got a little controversial that we were doing that because a lot, particularly people in England who grew up with the English adaptations, translations, uh, which were very well done, but they were done specifically for, that for a British audience. Yeah. But so we're just trying to make it American. And it makes sense. I'm glad you're doing that because I, I love those titles. But uh, just like manga, and I was reading a lot of, of manga back in the 90s and, and before with uh, uh, Rumiko Takahashi and people like that. And the struggle was always you bring it to the U.S., but you try and either adapt it one to one, which wouldn't make sense for the sensibilities here, or you'd, you'd try and convert it in a very strange way, which also would kind of lose out on the flavor. Because eventually they got it right, it seems like, for manga. And I'm glad you're doing that for Asterix and some of the other, hopefully some of the other European titles as well, which are great. Well, I think, I mean, possibly it's because uh, we had done so well with Smurfs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, kind of it. few people remember that, uh, well, Americans, for the most part, don't realize Smurfs were a European uh, comics. They think they were an 80s uh, Hanna-Barbera TV series, which it was, but based on those old comics during the 10 year craze uh, where Smurfs was so successful as a Saturday morning TV show, even Marvel had jumped on the bandwagon and had come out with three Smurf comic books, yeah. a treasury edition and some mini comics. And, uh, but they were doing the same thing. Uh, one of the book publishers did who came out with some of the uh, graphic novels. They just saw it as a, uh, a fad, you know, we'll, we'll get in, you know, they sell well, great. And now it's time to get out. You know? <laughs> Whereas uh, yeah. one of the things, which is uh, always confusing to me, because you always hear, you know, like uh, Will Eisner, nothing against Will, you know, uh, the graphic novel creator, blah, 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 blah. You know, when I was a little kid, I would go to Woolworths and they would have the Tin Tin books. Yeah, there, yeah was, sure. there was even an animated Tintin series I used to watch in New York City in the early mornings. They would have it, you know, Hergé's Adventures of Tintin. There was even a magazine called uh, Children's Digest, which I doubt you ever heard of, but which used to serialize Tintin in America. And uh, so that's been around all along. It was like, here's comics sold in bookstores. And it was totally under the radar, probably because it was in the children's section. But to me, it's like, it's great that's stuff. a graphic novel. Europeans yeah. have been, they've been calling them albums for years and years. You know, that's been around forever. Uh, so with the Smurfs, it was uh, for uh, a tiny company, again, like uh, Paper Cuts and even Asterix, the, uh, we're almost like an independent film company that's, you know, that's distributing foreign films in that regard, in that the budget to create a film is considerable, but the budget to import something where you're, you just have to translate and, you know, 
movies will either have subtitles or dub it and in comics who just get the re-letter it, you know, a lot easier now in the digital yeah. age. And, uh, you know, it, it's like to have that quality of material, uh, whether it's the Smurfs or Asterix, you know, the only, you know, like the third one, I'm hoping one day if we get Tintin as well, but, uh, complete that trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. It would just be, yeah. uh, you know, uh, but I, I, I'm happy about Asterix because, uh, selfishly, uh, you know, I was one of those people who would try to read the, the, the British versions and like, eh, I get it. it's kind of, it, it took work. Just, to get in there. Yeah. Well, I would, I would hold up sometimes the, um, the omnibus editions. And, uh, I keep trying to explain to my, my friends in France there that the only words on the covers that an 11 year old could possibly understand are and and the, you know, they don't necessarily, what does asterisk mean? What does omnibus mean? It's just, it's just, you're not doing anything. And, and one of the things I've enjoyed doing is explaining asterisks to Americans because they're overwhelmed. They think, Oh, it's probably a very sophisticated, you know, and it is all that other stuff as well, you know, it has satire and all sorts of great stuff, but uh, at the most basic level, it's almost like Popeye. Yeah, it's a fun. It's a, it's an adventure story. It's fun. You have it's, a little yeah. village where the it has a druid who has a, mm-hmm. created a magic potion that this little guy Asterix and his friend Obelix can can take, and they could uh, suddenly become super powerful, which uh, you know prevents you know where they could hold back the Roman Empire from. Yeah. taking over their little village. That's the basic concept. And yeah. uh, it's not that complicated. You know, kids can certainly, <laughs> you know, it's a classic underdog type of story. You know, yeah. there's the Romans. They want to take over. These guys won't let them. It's compared to One yeah. Piece a lot. And I think there's some there's some parallels between the two properties for sure. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, cool. someone else is publishing that. So, <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> otherwise, I would have mentioned that. But. Yeah, but uh, we'll have links to paper cuts and all that in the descriptions uh, where people Absolutely. can buy. Like, well, Asterix, I, I so. appreciate that. No, yeah. no, I just uh, uh, it, it's just it's just very exciting. I mean, uh, yeah. every single title we've ever done is uh, going back to what I said. You know, like uh, when that person asked, you know, would you miss editing Spider Man? Uh, no, there's, <laughs> there, there are just so many great comics that, you know, it, it, it's that same kind of relationship I felt I, I was trying to have with the audience that I try to have now where you can say, look at all this stuff, look at the, these great, this great stuff that, that, you know, here, enjoy, you know, there are times where, you know, whatever we try to do, we, you know, we have our failures and then there are. Uh, uh, two titles in particular, I think, are absolutely incredible that we weren't able to make successful. One was called um, Ernest and Rebecca, and the other one is Ariel. And uh, we published a bunch of them, and I'm very proud of those. But, uh, you know, it, it, it was tough, you know. And I, I think the books that tend to do best for us have a lot more accessible titles where people get it right away and uh, yeah. and uh, it's it's worked out uh, like uh asterix actually is is doing very well for us on uh, amazon and mm-hmm. uh, one of our other top sellers right now we're back to uh doing adaptations of things this is with nickelodeon we're doing the loud house which is one of their oh, yeah. uh, very successful you know i'm surprised you mostly have to be like 12 to be aware of that but, I, or have kids. I happen to have two kids, so uh, there you go. Yeah. So, uh, so they love it. They and, and it's yes. become a we're we're doing Loud House summer specials, winter specials, regular series. We launched a spinoff with the Casa Grande, so mm-hmm. you know we, we we love that. So it, it's great to have something that that works. And we're and one of the fun things about that, my assistant Jeff Whitman's the editor of that series. And he's been very successful at uh, getting the writers and artists from the uh, TV series to sort of like uh, fulfill their 
comic book fantasies of, <laughs> you know, they're, they're busy, you know, working on the TV show. So a lot of times all we could do is get like a three or four or five page story from them. But, you know, they, they like being involved and, 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 and that's just in keeping with my trying to keep as much of the flavor of the original property as possible. So if someone loves the, uh, the, the TV show, you know, we're, we're, Pretty sure they'll they'll enjoy uh, uh, our our version of it, and uh, my assistant again, Jeff Whitman, who does a great job editing it, uh, really makes a point to like he'll be online making you know whenever a new issue come new volume comes out to to track what the uh, fans are saying about it, and uh, you know very responsive to it. So it's very exciting, a lot of fun. Well, it's great. I hope people check it out. Uh, definitely. There's Have we gone of- to four hours yet? No, no, no <laughs> we haven't quite hit Snyder Cut yet, but uh, it is. Uh, I did want to thank you for all the time you gave us here today. It's, yes. it's my uh, pleasure. Absolutely amazing. And and I do hope people check it out. There's, I get a lot of people uh, who listen to these interviews and, and listen to Joe and I talk and, and just different pieces who are, are, who are wanting to find new things. And yeah. so I hope that they can, you know, expand out a little bit and look some of this stuff. It's, it's great. Yeah. What they what and one of the things I'll just uh, this was super important to me when I was a kid. I, I wasn't you know didn't have that much money. I grew up in the projects, uh, but back then comics were twelve cents. But even then, I remember for Avengers number fifty seven, I had to borrow a nickel from my younger brother to <laughs> to buy it. Yeah. So one of the one of the most dismaying things about comics for me is how expensive they are these days, graphic yeah. novels more so. But one of the good things is that, again, this was unthinkable when I was a kid, libraries have comics. Yes. You, you, know, you could go there. All you need is a library card. It's free. You could borrow these things. And, uh, and, and it's important that kids be aware of that. Uh, one of the things we do on our website is uh, there's a uh, – mailing list that they could join. And a lot of times we send out uh, free previews of our titles if you're on the mailing list. So you get a, you know, a, a peek at what we're offering. Um, so I, I wish I could make all our stuff free, but the best I could do is uh, I try to mention libraries as, as much as possible. So, uh, you know, there are lots of, I think it's so important. There are so many uh, kids who, uh, you know, they may not have computers. They may be struggling in life and, you know, in all sorts of difficult situations. But if they could get to a library, uh, there's so much great, not just not just paper cuts, but Marvel, DC, manga, all sorts of stuff. If they could, you know, maybe not all in the kids section, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. Uh, I, I stuff love available. that. That's Very an awesome reminder. People really do need to remember that. I mean, in, especially, I mean, we got a news of a price hike today with uh, one of the big publishers. So it is, I, I can't agree with you more there. We've got to make it accessible for kids, especially people being able to come in and, and get this. Well, stuff. smart kids yeah. you know, seem to be aware of it. I see lots of kids. They, you know, even my own assistant, actually, you know, he'll, he'll go to the, the library near where our office is and, fill his knapsack up with uh, graphic novels where I'm still, you know, spending my rent money going to uh, Midtown Comics, uh, buying, (laughs) (laughs) you know, tons of graphic novels and comic books. Yeah. It's a, it's a great resource. People should, yeah, they definitely keep that in mind and and hopefully we can get more kids out in that direction. But, uh, but Jim, thank you so much. And adults. Yes, Yes, that's right. They're free. They're there. (laughs) You just have to get, back that's a hard thing for a lot of comedy yeah. i uh, <laughs> i can't thank you enough for spending all this time with us i, I really appreciate it and, and mm-hmm. amazing stories and i know everybody's gonna love uh love it so you're very thank kind you. thank you so thank much. you very much yep i appreciate it. thanks for putting up with me i do go on and on but thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, anytime well i hope we can talk to you again very soon we can talk yeah. to you thanks for producing i'd love i'd love to my pleasure you know I, I hope uh I hope everyone uh, who's still listening, uh, if they take away anything at all, you know, it's like uh, the the best uh, thing I could, you know, offer anyone. If they're not already going to the library, uh, it's such an incredible resource. Uh, You know, you can virtually get any comic you want these days there. Oh, wonderfully said.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.